welcome to this interesting session on JavaScript. So we're going to start this session by understanding what is JavaScript and the different data types in JavaScript. Once you understand the different data types in JavaScript, we'll go through the operators, conditional statements, and loops in JavaScript. Once you understand all the basic concepts in JavaScript, we'll look into the functions in JavaScript and finally end the session with event handling and objects. In the section of event handling, we'll look into the browser object model, DOM, and form validation. So today we have a special guest, Gauri, who's going to take this session forward. So over to you, Gauri. Hi, all. I welcome each and every one of you. To know what is JavaScript, we just need to know what are web pages or web apps. A web app is something that is available on web or an internet. So whenever we say the word internet, what comes to our mind is nothing but the browser. Whenever we open a browser and hit a link on the browser, what gets on the screen is a web page. Page that is hosted on a browser that is shown by the browser to us is called as a web page. This web page shows us the data that we want to see from where the data comes up. So if this is your browser, it will show you the web page from where the data comes up. Data comes up from something called as most of the time it comes up from the server. So both of them keep talking to each other. Now, whatever coding that we do on the server side, it is called a server side programming. And whatever coding that we do on this browser side, it is called as client side programming. JavaScript is a client side scripting language and not a server side scripting language. So what we are learning is on the left hand side here. Though we know that where we have placed our JavaScript, how we will write a JavaScript code. To write a JavaScript code, what do we require is nothing but an HTML file. What is an HTML file? Ultimately, we have to see our page on the browser and our browser understands only markup languages. HTML is one such markup language which stands for Hypertext Markup Language. So this browser of yours has something called as a parser inside which reads an HTML file. Now, how do we write this HTML file? To write this HTML file, we just have to open up a notepad, write the file as per the rules that are defined, okay, and save this file with an extension as either .html or .htm. So why are we learning about this HTML file? It is because HTML file is the host for our JavaScript code. If we want to place our JavaScript code, we need to have an HTML file because without HTML file, we cannot write a JavaScript code or rather we cannot see what is happening in the JavaScript code. It's like a host for our JavaScript code. So our JavaScript code, which we will be learning, will reside in this HTML file. So we have in short understood that we are now concentrating only on the client side programming. Secondly, we want to type in the code that is JavaScript code. For that, we need to have an HTML file. So let's start creating our first HTML file. For that, simplest thing is to open up a notepad and keep typing the HTML code. How do you write an HTML code? An HTML code is always written in these tags call as HTML tag. Every tag in HTML has two parts, start tag and end tag. And whatever you write within it is its content. So basically an HTML tag has two children, head and body. Head is that child which concentrates on the title or how the header of this file will look like on the browser. Whereas body is that child which concentrates on the complete page that we will see on the browser. We will have to save this file with the extension as .html. Let's create one folder. In this folder, let's save this file as static.html. Make sure that you choose all files because we have changed the extension. So if you just concentrate that I have changed the extension of this file as .html. If you notice, the icon of this page changes to the default browser it is. 
that makes us sure that this is an HTML file. So if I double click, this file will open with a browser. If you want to open it with the browser of your choice, you can say right click open with Google Chrome or whichever file that you want or whichever browser that you want to choose. In this file, if you keep writing some elements in the body part, that will be shown on the browser. What all elements are present in HTML are, you can see a button, you can see something like input box, you can have a paragraph, etc. So there are many many elements that we can write in an HTML file. So when I save this file and try to refresh this file, I will see a lot of things. I have seen an input, I can see a button which is clickable, this is editable and this is a static paragraph that I can see. So these are all the elements I can fit in the body part which can be rendered on the browser. Now, whenever I create my HTML file, it's most of the time a static file. What do you mean by static? Whatever I add onto this HTML file will be shown onto the browser. There is nothing extra or there is nothing that will work at the runtime or dynamically that cannot happen if I have a plain HTML file. And that's where the need of JavaScript comes. Whenever we use JavaScript in an HTML, we add that dynamicness to the HTML file. So as you can see that, this is a static paragraph. This is what I have written. I want to write something like my name is ABC. So here I will have to give all the data to this HTML file. Then only that file will render it. So that is why I call this HTML as a static thing. Whatever I add into the body part that will be rendered. And that's why we want to add something called as JavaScript. That is the use of JavaScript. Let's see what is JavaScript. Without any additional libraries, JavaScript is also called as vanilla JavaScript. So as I told you, when we will be covering up in first three modules, complete vanilla JavaScript. JavaScript is a language which is case sensitive language. It is a programming language or rather to be very specific, it is called as a scripting language which helps in making interactive web pages or like adding some dynamicness to the web page. How is it interpreted? So it is interpreted and executed on the client machine that is on the browser. It is used as the default scripting language for HTML pages. This particular language reduces the load on the server as some operations are done on the client side. Let me give you an example. Now, if you have a web page which takes up two numbers and gives you the summation of two numbers. If you have this data of two numbers, you need not go to the server and tell the server that please add these two numbers and give me the result back. Because JavaScript is a client side language which can take up these two values, calculate the value and show the result to the end user. So that's how you have lessened down the burden. Since JavaScript is rich in operators and loops, things which are possible to be worked with on the client side, you can do all those tasks using JavaScript, thereby reducing the load on the server. History of JavaScript. It was first developed in 1995 with the version as 1.0, then came up 1.1, then came up in 1997 1.2, 1998, 1.3 and 9, we started calling it as JScript 5. Now, previously this JavaScript was supported by only specific browsers. But nowadays it is supported by many, many browsers or rather all the browsers. Initially it was supported by, if you can see, Netscape Navigator 2.0. Then it started like Microsoft Internet Explorer also started supporting it. As you can see that till 1999 it was like only two browsers were supporting it. But now all the browsers are supporting it and to use the best browser to use for UI development or what is called as JavaScript coding would be Chrome as it helps us with many debugging tools. Okay, we will see what are debugging tools that the browser has. 
Now, as you can see that there is something called its Java word in this Java script and many a times we start feeling that, okay, they are something related, but no, that's not the way. They both are not related to each other. Java is an object-oriented programming language and rather it is a language which is developed to build your complete business logic. It has some part like say JSPs which will run on the browser also, okay, but doesn't mean that it is a purely client-side language. You can use it on both the sites, whereas JavaScript will be run only and only on the browser. For Java program to run, it needs to be first compiled and then it is executed. Whereas for JavaScript, though the compilation happens, but not line to line compilation. We will see what exactly or how the compilation happens in JavaScript. But it is always said that it is just in time compilation, that it is basically interpreted. There is no lag like first it will be compiled, it will, it will take some time and then it will be executed. No, it is like just in time compilation happens and the execution starts. For Java, there is something called a static type checking and for JavaScript, it is dynamic type checking. So we will see this static and dynamic type checking when we will look into something called as data types in JavaScript. Where can we use this JavaScript? Well, we know that it can be used on the client side scripting to add dynamicness. Now, in case you really don't need your server to work or exert, and you can handle all the logic at client side, then such applications do exist which are completely made up of JavaScript, for example, some gaming applications or mobile apps, etc. So nowadays, JavaScript is booming up a lot and it can be used in all these fields. So let's get started up with the JavaScript part. How do we write the script or how do we embed our script in the HTML file we have created? We can embed it in two ways. One is internal embedding and one is external. Let's see both the ways. Like any other tag, okay, we have these tags here, body tag, then um, head tag. There is one more tag which is available which helps us to embed JavaScript in HTML and the tag name is script. And we can write our JavaScript code within these two tags. So whenever we write any code within these two tags, it is called as internal embedding that happens. Before writing any script in the script tag, let us understand basics of this JavaScript. As we write something in the body part of HTML, basically what we need to do, why do we have this user interface? User interface is available so that the user will enter some details, so you will get some data, work on that data. That is what is the main aim of having an interface. So we will be adding many elements so that the user will be able to add the data with ease. For example, we'll be able to add some uh, radio buttons, some check boxes, then we can add some input boxes, then we can have some buttons, etc. So all these elements we can just put in onto the body tag that we have in our HTML page. When we add all these elements in JavaScript, what we get is nothing but a big bucket. This bucket has all these elements. Some are buttons, some are input types, some are radio buttons, etc. So these are called as elements in this bucket. And this big bucket is referred in JavaScript as document. To be technical, document is a ready-made object that is available in JavaScript. Using this document, I can access all the elements that are there on this page. This document, that is the object, has many methods already defined which help us to reach to that particular element. The methods are like get element by id or document object you can use get elements by tag name or there is one more like get element by class name. So there are many many methods which are available which will give us an access to this particular element. Now if we want to make use of the methods like get element by id then we should make sure that we give some identification to these elements. 
So when we write these elements, we make sure that they have some ID that is given up. We will also have to make sure that if we want by using this method only one element, then the ID should be unique. I cannot use the same ID for some other element. If we want to use something called as class name, then I need to add the class name here. So as many attributes I can add, using those attributes, I can access these elements. And after accessing these elements, I can work around on this element. I can work around on its look and feel. I can work around on its functionality. I can work around on anything because I have got like, I could conquer this particular element. So to conquer or to get this element, we have many methods which are available with this document object. I as a developer, I don't create this document object. It is JavaScript which prepares this document objects and gives that to us. We just have to straight away use this object. It is kind of a ready-made object in JavaScript. So let's try to see how do we use one of the elements. Use the object document, say get element by ID. If you just see the naming convention of these method is using camel casing. That is the first letter is smaller and the next letter of every word is capital. So I want to access this particular ID, this particular paragraph. So if I want to use this particular paragraph, I would give it that I want to get the element whose ID is demo. Once I got this element, I want to change whatever is its inner HTML that is written. So currently it is, this is a static paragraph. I want to change it to this is a dynamic paragraph. So I want to change the property of this element and the name of the property is inner HTML. So that's what I'm doing. What am I doing is that I am taking this particular element by ID and I'm changing its value. So previously it was static paragraph. Now I want to change it to dynamic paragraph. Now, where have I placed this particular script tag? If you can see the script tag that I have added, the script tag is below the body. That is where body ends up. Why have I placed it below the body? I will explain you the reason in a few minutes. So let me save this file. File is having head part, a body part and a script part. Script part is added, embedded internally. This is how we add JavaScript internally. Within the script part, I have written only one statement in which what am I doing is that using the document, which is a ready-made object, I get the element whose ID is demo and changing its inner HTML. Let me see how it works. Can you see that? The value of that paragraph is now dynamic paragraph. If I want to use external scripting, then what do I have to do? I will have to copy whatever is in this script tag. Copy this in another file. And save this file as a JavaScript file. And how do I do that? Dot .js. I put an extension dot .js and save this file. If I open it in the folder structure, I'll be able to see that the icon of the JavaScript file has changed, which makes me sure that, okay, this is a JavaScript type of a file. And now I will have to link these two files. To link this file, I will have to keep the script tag as is and just write something called a source that from where I am using it. Now, I have returned the name of the file with a complete extension. That is dynamic.js. I want to be double sure, then let me just copy it from here and paste it here. Since the file that is JavaScript file and an HTML file in which it will be linked, both of them are residing in the same folder, I can directly write the name of the file. But if this file is residing in some other folder, I will have to give its complete path. I can give its absolute path or its relative path. So let me see after giving an external JavaScript file, will my code work as expected? Yes, it does. So this is how we can add 
internally and externally the JavaScript part. Now the question remains like why did I write that script tag at the bottom of the file? If you just want to debug your page what you can do is right click on the page and choose inspect. When you choose inspect okay you'll get all these values. So I'm using currently Google Chrome. If anybody is using Google Chrome they will see all these values. So elements will show you all the elements that are present on this tag. So there is something like one button. There's another button which is there. Okay, within this button is your input. Okay, then two paragraphs. That is what is there in the button. So let me see, have I done it that way? Yes, I've kept this button not closed. So if I just refresh it. So I have a button separately. I have an input box. I have a paragraph. I have another paragraph. And that is what I have in the body tag. Okay, so if I just want to see any of these elements, I can see them in the elements tag. What is sources all about? If you add anything externally, you will be able to see all the sources that are attached here. Currently, I have a JavaScript file which is attached externally. So I can see that in the sources tab. What is this console tag all about? In learning any language, we need to actually know how to test our bugs in it or test whatever coding that we have done. Any other language has standard output, standard console. For example, if we use Java, we will have a standard console, like a command prompt will be our console. For any other language, most of the times command prompt is our console. For browser to see our console, every browser has this inspect element and using this inspect element, there'll be a console tag, okay, or console tab, which is there, that will help us to see the output. So this is a console tab which is present. Now, if I move the script tag above this, above the body tag, maybe somewhere in the head. And I try to refresh the page. You will see that whatever I have written in the JavaScript did not get executed. Why that has happened? You can see that I have got one error as well. Just go to the console, you will see the error. The error is clear that is JavaScript cannot set the property called as inner HTML of null. So there is nothing and that nothing's inner.html I have to set. Why this has happened? As you write your HTML page and you paste that page on the browser, browser's control start executing. So the control comes here, okay, it reaches head, it comes to script. So it starts executing the script. In the meanwhile, it also starts rendering your page and rendering all the elements. So till the time your script is getting executed, it may happen that your element has not rendered. Since your element is not present on the page, this code will definitely give you an error because there won't be any element with the ID as demo. That is why make sure that you write a script at the end of body tag so that whenever the page gets completely rendered then only your script will work. Doing this the error goes and you can see that your script is getting executed. So that's what we have done. We just got started up with JavaScript. So that's where you can see that how we have added our script tag. So script tag can be added within the body tag or even below the HTML, even when the HTML gets over, you can write your JavaScript. Not an issue. How to add it internally and externally? We know to internally add, you just have to write script tag and within that all the code of JavaScript. If you want to add it externally, then you write an attribute in the script tag that is SRC stands for source. You can write the name of the file if the file that is the JavaScript file exists in the same folder as that of the HTML file. If it doesn't then give its path. Let's just see a beautiful example. The name of the example is display sun in a paragraph on your HTML. To do so what are the steps? You have to open up your notepad file, write an HTML code, Make sure that you save your file with an extension .html or htm. Create a one more file called as a JavaScript file. Save it with the extension as .js and link it in your HTML code. To link, use the attribute src in the script tag. 
Okay, check that your HTML and JavaScript file are located in the same folder as you have just mentioned the name of the JavaScript file. Now open up your HTML file with a browser and check the output that you have created. So that's where we have completed a small part like where, what is JavaScript, where is it placed and how do I write a JavaScript. Let's move on to the next part in the JavaScript which is data types in JavaScript. Like document, there is something called as one more object that is ready-made and available in JavaScript which is called as console. This console object helps us to write something on the console. And console is what? If you just inspect on your browser, you will be able to see a screen called as console. So if you want to see something not on the browser but on console just to check whether your logic is working fine, you can use make use of that object called as console. Now using notepad is very trivial. Okay, you can make use of many other text editors which are available in the market like there's notepad plus plus, there is eclipse, there is sublime text which I'm using currently. So there are many text editors and what is the advantage of using these editors is that you can get some type forwards, you can get some help. So you may not type everything from scratch. For example, if I want to now write my HTML page here in sublime text, so I create one more folder here. Okay, the name of the folder is say Adureka and within this Adureka I try to create a file. And I make sure that I save this file as an HTML file. So I just create this static or like say our first dot HTML file. And if I type this HTML code, can you see the magic? It has already returned some piece of code which is like a basic thing that I need to write. So I may waste my time in writing all this. So it has helped me. It has done this type forwarding. Okay, the code forwarding is, has been already done. So that is why I would suggest each and every one of you to use some kind of IDs okay, that will help us to type in faster. So let's try to see, let's create one uh, script tag here okay, with its uh, source as the same folder okay, and uh, data, data types dot javascript. So let's create one data types dot javascript file in the same folder. Save this file in the same folder as Adureka. Right click onto the folder to save this file as data types. Learning data types in this language that is JavaScript language. As I told you if you want to see anything on the console to learn something you should see some output that gives us you know kind of inspiration to learn any new language. So that is why I have introduced this console topic okay which is a ready-made object like document and using this object we can type in anything onto this console. If you want to type something on the browser using your JavaScript you can use your older object that is document and to write something on the browser the method that is used is document.write. Okay? So let's use both these so when I say console dot the method that is used is log so within this log I can just say that hello everyone and save this file. So I've written a JavaScript and there is one HTML file though the HTML file has no elements on this file but yes it has a script that has got embedded. Let's try to run this file. So let's just open this folder. So you can see that there is first HTML, open it on Chrome. So since there is no element present in the body tag, I will not be able to see anything on this page. If I right click and inspect and I open up tab console, I can see that whatever I have typed in console.log method, I can see it here. Okay, if I want to write something on this browser using JavaScript, it would be something like this. browser. Every statement in JavaScript will end with a semicolon. Let me run this. Can you see that I have written it onto the browser now. Moving ahead with 
data types in JavaScript. There are around 5-6 data types which are present in JavaScript. They are number, boolean, string, then there is object, okay, and there are some special values. So this type 4, type 5, and type 6, though they are different types, but they are considered as one type in JavaScript called as object, undefined and not a number are some special values which are present in JavaScript. How do we write a variable? JavaScript variables can be considered as containers which store a particular value or name for a particular block of memory. Now, as any other language which has a strict type, for example, if you take up Java or C++, if I want a number, a variable that should contain only a number, then I make sure that I declare that variable with its type, for example, int a. So now variable a will always contain a number. But it is not the case in JavaScript. You will always mark any variable as of the type var, stands for variable. So it's like a general thing. You can again imagine it to be a bucket. Whatever value you add on to this particular bucket, that type of bucket will become. If you assign to this variable a a number, it will be of the type number. If you add it a string, it will be of the type string. If you add it something like, you know, an object, it will be of the type object. If you add an array, it will be of the type array. To name your variable, you should follow some rules. What are the rules? The rule says that you cannot use any JavaScript language specific keyword. That is something like if, for, do, function. So all these keywords have some meaning in JavaScript. There is some logic, there is something that will execute if you use such keywords. So you cannot name your variable with the keywords that are existing in JavaScript language. You cannot start your JavaScript variable with a digit. Neither can you use special characters like percentage, dollar, ampersand while naming your variable. Always start your variable with an alphabet and then you can follow that alphabet with a digit or an underscore. You can make use of uppercase or lowercase alphabets. So here are some examples. See valid is something like sum or you can have first underscore name, unit underscore test one. Invalid is you cannot start it with a digit. You cannot use a keyword like function and cannot use a special character called as dollar. Okay, so these are some of the rules of defining your variable. So let's see all these types of variables. To see the types, let me remove this code. Create a variable, say a, or you can just create a variable called as general. Let's see what this general variable that I have created, this is called as a declaration. I haven't initialized this variable. I haven't given it any value. Let us see what value by default it takes up if I do not initialize it. So to see that, you can just write console dot log within which you can just type in this value. Copy, paste it. Semicolon, save the file and can you see that by default it gets the value called as undefined. That is why it is said that there is undefined is a sp special value in JavaScript. So to the same variable, okay, which is not of any type as of now, let me add this general a number. And let me see like what type of variable this becomes. To check that what type of variable is this general keyword or general variable is, the operator to be used is called as type of. All small type of. So this operator, okay, will tell you whatever is on its right hand side, what is its type. Okay, so can you see that the type is now number? If I give this general, okay, a string value and now check its type. Can we see that the type has now changed to string? If I give it a string value with a single quote, let me see what is the type that it becomes. Again a string. So we have covered up this number and string. Let's try giving it a boolean value. 
something like say true. Let us see what value it takes up. The variable now becomes boolean type. So it is like the paint that you want to paint it. Okay, it will be of that particular type. If I want to give it another type of value like say null or an array or let us make it an object. So for all these three types, the type will be always an object. And let's see what type it becomes. So it becomes an object type of data now. So let's start with the next data type that is arrays. To write an array, okay, we have a syntax which is shown here in the declaration part. When you write this variable space, so space is equal to and you initialize it to a square bracket, that means it is of the type array. Now array internally in JavaScript is treated as an object. To write this array, there are two ways. Either you can initialize it using a square bracket or you can make use of something called as a new operator. Next, after the word new, you have to make use of array keyword and then it is followed by brackets in which you will be writing the name of the elements or whatever elements you want to add. What is an array? If you just see this, how memory takes it, for example, this is your memory. And if I try to write something called as variable A, which is equal to 9, then a small memory is allocated or a small place is allocated in the memory which will hold the value 9 for you. And now your variable A will be pointing to this memory location. Now, for example, if you want to add marks of, say, 10 students, how would you go about it? You will create a variable marks of student 1, marks of student 2, marks of student 3 and so on. So there will be so many variables that will be created. So in such a scenario, we will have almost 10 variables that will hold marks of 10 students. But using array, this problem is solved. Using array, memory is allocated okay, sequentially having elements in it. Like if you want to store marks of 10 students, then there will be 10 elements. If you want to store marks of 5 students, then 5 elements will be created. Let's just create an array of marks of 5 students. Now, how do we declare an array? To declare an array, we can make use of something called as variable A is equal to square brackets. We can add all the marks like this. This is one way of declaring an array. Another way of declaring an array is that you can make use of the keyword new with the keyword array with a capital A followed by these brackets. And within the bracket, you can give all the values of the elements. So what is the use of it is that memory is allocated sequentially plus you can access all the marks using only one variable and individually also you can access every element. How do you do that? Every element in the array has one index. An index of the array always starts with 0. So if you have added around 5 elements, then the last index would be 5 minus 1, that is 4. It always starts with 0. And if you want to individually access these elements, then how do you do that? Is that you write A of 0. If you want to access the second element, you will write A of 1. If you want to access the third element, it is A of 2. If you want to access the fourth element, it will be A of 3. This is how you can individually access these elements. So let's try to create our array here. Let's make this general variable to hold an array. And let's see what type of value it gives us. You can notice it again gives us object type of value. So if you initialize any variable to the type as array, it will be of the type object. Now along with this type, we can also check what is the length of this array. So whenever we have an array type of object, we can get its length by using this property called as length. Let's see what is the length of this you can check that the length is 4. If you cross check 1, 2, 3, 4, the length is 4, but the index will have from 0, 1, 2 and 3. So these were some of the data types that are present in JavaScript which we need to be comfortable with. Okay, now 
type conversions. We have this concatenation operator called as plus. Now this operator is really magical or what you can call it as an overloaded operator. Now to this operator, if you give on both the sides numbers, so if you say 2 plus 3, it will add both the numbers and give you the summation. Let's just check it. So if you want to say 2 plus 3, and let's just see what is the output that I get. Okay, the spelling is wrong. It is console. You can say that it is giving me the sum. Okay, but if you give on both the side of this plus operator string type of data, say hi plus, say there. In such a scenario, it will give you a concatenated string. So definitely this type what it gives back is a number type. This is a string type and when both the operands on this plus operator are string then it concatenates the string. So what if I give one number and one string? In this case let me see how it works. It again acts as a concatenated type. So that is what is this magical operator concatenation operator works as which is also our topic called as type conversion a process where an entity of one data type is converted to the other there are two ways in which type conversion is done in JavaScript there's something called as implicit conversions where an integer is converted to string and back automatically and that is what we do by using this operator now for example we have a variable num1 here which is initialized to 5 so its type of will always give us number as the value. To this number, if I add one more number, then definitely num2 will be of the type integer or a number. But to the same number, if I add 5 as the value, but with quoted value, that means I'm adding a string to it, that time this num3 will become a string type of object automatically it will change its type. So based on what value are you adding to the existing value, the type will automatically change. By default, okay, if you make use of something called as prompt, what is a prompt? A prompt is something which prompts you to write in the data. So like that, there is a function in JavaScript, which is a global function called as prompt. Okay, If you write that prompt, okay, your browser will actually ask you to add some value. Let's try doing this. So if I just say prompt enter some value. Can you see that it is asking me to enter some value? So it is prompting me that okay enter some value. So whatever value I add, I may add number 3 or I may add a string or I may add anything by default, whatever value I add in this prompt, okay, is of the type string. So though I add a number, it is of the type string. So if I take whatever value that I have given as num1, okay, and then I want to see what is the type of this num1. So I type in type of num1. Let us see what happens. It asks me, so I write 4 and console.log. Let me rewrite it, the number 4. So you can see the type is string. So whatever I write in this prompt is by default taken as string. So if it is a string, okay, and then using my value, like I want to write console.log, I take this num1 okay, and I want to add number 9 to it. So whatever value you add, I want to add number 9 to it. But will this work now? It won't. Why? Because num1 is of the type string and we know that when concatenation operator has one string type, it converts this whole thing as a string and it will just concatenate instead of adding these two numbers. So for that matter, I will have to convert the string into an integer or float for that matter. So there are some methods which are available called as parse int or parse float. To these methods, if you pass a string, it will convert it into 
an integer. So let us see what is the value that we get. So I have 2 and I will get the value as 11. But if I had not done that parse int, okay, then I would have got 2, 9 as the value. So this is what prompt does. There is one more method which is available called as alert, which also gives you a kind of alert. Hi, this is an alert. So you will see the difference. Prompt will pro ask you to write a value, whereas alert will just give you a message back. Okay? So these are uh, two different methods which are available with JavaScript. With this, we have completed data types in JavaScript. And let's now move on to the operators part of the JavaScript. So there are these many operators available in JavaScript. Arithmetic operator, string operator, assignment operator, comparison operator, ternary operator, and Boolean operators. Of which we have covered up string operator. That is your concatenation operator. We have also seen arithmetic operator like plus. So similarly, your minus, multiplication, division, modulus, increment, decrement operators will work. Let's just see it's practical. Let's create one more JavaScript file and name it as operators.javascript. We want to link this particular file in the script. So I can add as many scripts as I want. Okay. So let us just add this file also. So both the scripts will run. First this script file will run, then this script file will run. As of now, we have already tested this script file. So let us comment this file. You can comment this file. So once we comment, what do you mean by commenting any line? Is your parser in the browser will ignore that line. To comment in HTML, it is angular bracket, exclamatory mark, hyphen, hyphen. And it with hyphen, hyphen and angular bracket. To comment in your JavaScript, you can use two slashes. So this is a comment. So let's learn this arithmetic operators now. Simple operators are there like any other language has. For example, 2 plus 3 will add the two values to minus, say, 1 will subtract okay so it's simple so we can have something like 2 minus 1 directly or we can have you know variable difference is equal to say 3 minus 2 okay and then we can log this console as difference so whatever is the value in the difference will come here if you want to see a product of two numbers you just can say that 7 into 8 or 9 Okay, and log that product. If you want to see division, then you can create one more variable if you want and just say phi divide by and just write it on the log to see the output. To see modulus, you can just say that mod is equal to 5 percentage 4. So modulus is something which gives you the remainder. So what this has is difference. So let's just write a string called as difference. Here we are writing the product. So let us know that it is a product. Here we are writing what is the output of the division. And here we will be checking with the modulus. Let's just see the output of this. So the difference is 1, product is 63, 2.5 is the modulus uh, division and modulus is 1. What is incrementing and decrementing operators like plus plus? So as we have seen that the difference is 1. Okay, If you just want to increase it by 1. So what you can do is just say difference plus plus. It is as good as writing something like this. Difference is equal to whatever is the current value of difference plus 1. If I do it different minus minus, then it is as good as writing difference is equal to whatever is the current value of difference minus 1. So these are your increment and decrement operators. So now your difference value has already got incremented by 1. If you want to test it, 
you can just run this and you can see that previously it was 1 and now it has become 2. It has got incremented by 1. So those were your arithmetic operators plus minus division modulus product okay and incrementing and decrementing operators. This was a string operator which is already cleared. Let's move on to the next type of operator that is assignment operator of which we have already checked equal to. So whenever we declare a variable, variable A and we just say equal to that means we are assigning a value that is this A will hold now so and so value. What is this plus and equal to? If you just see the uh, description it says add assign. So you add some value and then assign that newer value to the variable. Subtract and assign. So you subtract some value and then assign the value to the variable. Let us see the examples of that. Let's just comment these lines because this execution has been already seen. You can comment multiple line by using slash star. Okay, so all these lines are now commented and till here I want to comment. So you can use slash star back. Let us now see the next type of operators which are your assignment operators. So for example, if I have variable say s is equal to 9, it's a number type of variable. I can do something like 9 plus equal to 8, variable s plus equal to 8. So it is as good as you're writing s is equal to whatever is the current value of s plus 8. So let's see what is the output that we get here. Let me run this. Can you see that the output or the value of s has changed to 17? Similarly, if you do s minus 8, minus equal to 8, so the value should be 1. Similarly, you can make use of multiplication and division, even the modulus sign. So these were some of the assignment operator and some normal assignment operator and some advanced assignment operator. Let us move on to the next operator that is comparison operators. Now what do I mean by comparison operator or why do we require comparison operator? See, many a times we need to compare two things to draw some logic. For example, if these two variables are equal, then I want to do something. If these two things are not equal, then I want to do something. So that's called as logic building. You build up a logic. And whenever you build a logic, you need to compare the two operators. To build up a logic, the main statement that we usually use is an if-else statement which will be covered when we'll cover up loops. So let me introduce that if-else loop here to explain you what are comparison operators. Okay, let us comment these now and move on to the next set of operators called as comparison operators. What is an if loop? Okay, how do we see other if loop? If loop is, see in your day-to-day -day life, if you want to write a logic, say, when will you drive? If you have some conditions put up, like if the road is four lane, then I will drive the car today. Else I will not drive. So if this is your logic, okay, and that's what you want to write in your code. If you want to do that, okay, there's the simplest way of doing it by using if-else statement. If-else statement has a syntax like if and in the bracket you will write your condition. If this condition is true then whatever statements you have written in this brace bracket will get executed. If the condition is false then whatever you have written in this brace bracket will get executed. So this condition has to now be the output should be either true or false. And how will you get such an output? Only if you make use of something called as comparison operator. And the comparison operators which are available with us are equal to equal to, not equal to, then if it is greater than, lesser than. So all these operators will always give us output which is of the type boolean. For example, I can have something like variable s is equal to 9. That is variable s2 
which is equal to 8. So I want to say that whenever S1 and S2 are equal, then you write, do something. If they are not equal, then you do something else. If I want to write that in the pseudo or in the code, that is JavaScript code, I will say S equal to equal to S2. That means if both of them are equal, then you write on the console, okay, that yes, S1 is equal to S2. This is what you will be printing. If it is not equal, then you will be printing that yes, both of them are not equal. To check whether they are not equal, the comparison operator is an exclamatory mark and an equal to sign. So I get the output as S1 and S2 are not equal. Why are they not equal? Because one's value is 9, another's value is 8. So that is why they are not equal. So it comes to this else part and executes this part. If I write here the condition as not equal to, and I would say here it is if part, this is else part. And run this, I would get the answer as if part. Because what I'm testing here is if they are not equal to, then you execute this. If they are equal to, then you execute this. Now within this equal to equal to, there's something called as triple equal to. What does it do? With triple equal to, okay, it also checks its type. Now for example, if S2 is also 9, but its type is string, and you write here S1 is equal to S2. Let's see what gets executed. It is still in the if part. It says that S1, S is, is equal to S2. Though the value is same, but the type is different. And if you want to even check the type, then you can write one more equal to here and make it something like S triple equal to S2. In that case, it will go to else part because the value is same, but the type is not the same. That is why this will give you false. You can check something like, you know, if it is greater than, equal to. So which means that S can be either greater than S2 or it can be equal to. In both the conditions, this will get executed. So let's see what is the output here. Yes, if part. So it is equal to that holds good. If the value is 10 here, this will go to the else part. So this is how we write this comparison operator. So wherein we can write greater than you know, lesser than, lesser than, equal to, triple equal to, double equal to, not equal to. So all these comparisons can be done using the comparison operators. Let's move on to the next part, that is Boolean operators. Now, Boolean operators, where do we use this Boolean operators? These Boolean operators are, for example, if you want to use the same if-else statement. So what was your first condition if the road is four lane, then, will you, then only you will be driving the car. If you want to add some more conditions, like if the road is four lane and the traffic is very less, then only I will drive the car. So you have just attached one more and and one more condition. So if you're working with multiple conditions and if you want all of them, you know, to be true, you will use and operator. So it should be like if S1 is greater than equal to 2 and and S1 is like triple equal to S2. Okay, so that means its type is also true and even this is condition is true. Then only you execute this part. This is how you can attach two conditions by using and operator. But what if you want to write conditions and it is like any one of this condition is true, then you should execute this part in such a scenario, you will be using OR here. To write OR, it is two pipelines. So it depends on what logic you want to write, okay? Whether you want to write that both the conditions should be fulfilled, it is strict, then you will go for AND operator. If both the conditions, if any one of them is true, then it is OR condition. What is negation condition? Now whatever the output of this condition, may it be true, may it be false. If the output of this condition is true, but you want it to be false, then what you do is you negate it. That is, you add one operator outside this bracket. Which means that when you write a negation here or a not, 
okay that time whatever is the output of this inner bracket that will be negated if it is true this will be false so the output of this whole condition is negation of this inner bracket okay you don't want something to happen if this is your logic at that point you know how to write the condition of what should happen so you can just write a negation in front of that logic or in front of that condition and last and the final operator is your ternary operator now what is this ternary operator all about ternary operator has two syntaxes or two operators it's a combination of two operators how do you do that let us first comment these and let's move on to the next that is ternary operator in ternary operator okay you have these two parts okay the part is divided by your question mark so question mark has is left hand side and right hand side on its left hand side you will write a logic that will always give you output as true or false so definitely you will be using your comparison operator okay and writing a logic so you write that 1 is greater than 2 so this is using comparison operator either this will give me true or false so if this gives me true as the answer then what should be executed will be returned on the left hand side of this colon so i will type in true and if the output of this condition is false then this will get executed whatever you have written on the right hand side of this colon so let's see what will be the output here it will be false because one is not greater than 2 so output of this condition is false so it will go on the right hand side of this colon so ternary operator is always having question mark and colon a question mark separates the condition and the result whereas colon separates your true and false results so there we end up our operators and let's move on with the loops so out of this conditional statements we have already covered up if and if else statement what is this if else if else statement so of this conditional statements we have already covered up if and if else now what is this if else if else statement as i said that if has two parts when it is true it will execute if block if it is false it will execute the else block what if within the else block also you want to write one more condition in such a case you will write a statement which will have syntax like if then else then again if and again else let's see an example of such a syntax this is a normal if condition see for example you can ask the user to prompt your age and check that age whether it is greater than 60 and you can write a message that as you are more than 60 years old you have to control your salt and sugar intake so your condition is age greater than 60 with a comparison operator which will give you either true or false so if it is true then only this statement will get executed if it is false then nothing will happen okay because there is no else block that is written if you just move a heed you will see that if your age is less than 30 is your condition so in this condition if it is true then your if block will execute if the condition is false then the else block will get executed okay so we just have seen like how if else block gets executed now if what if in the else block also you want to write some condition for example you ask the user to prompt his or her age the user adds his or her age you take it in a variable called as age and in this age variable you write a condition that age is greater than 60 then you have to control your sugar and salt intake then you understand when you will reach else part that means he is not greater than 60 that means his age is either from 0 to 59 so within that also if you want to categorize it like whether if age is greater than 30 or not so if it is greater than 30 then definitely he has to be cautious about what he is eating may not control totally but yeah some sense of cautiousness so that you can put in again one more if block after else so such a statement is called as if else if else statement so we have seen such beautiful examples on the screen 
let's move on to the next conditional statement called as a switch statement what is the switch statement switch statement always takes one value now it is not taking a comparison operator not always the output of the value on which the switch statement is return should not always give you boolean value it may also give you an integer it may also give you a floating point number a string so when your condition is going to give you such values that is not boolean value then you may go for this switch statements now how is this switch statement return if you just see that you ask for a user to prompt his or her weight you can switch this particular weight now weight is what it is of the type float and we are perfect of using this switch statement for this weight value now after the switch statement the block that will get executed should have cases now what are these cases all about it is like you know a broad spectrum that you provide like weight can have the value like 10.5 20.5 or any value for each value what is to be done that you will write next to this case statement for example if the weight is 10.5 then you will write on the document that your weight is so and so if your weight is 20.5 you will write that on the document that it is 20.5 what is this default doing here it may so happen that weight will have many many values so you will keep on writing all the cases and sometimes you may miss one of the case so it's better to write something called as a default case so this case will get executed if none of them fits in if 10.5 doesn't fit in 20.5 doesn't fit in if i write it as 11.5 then i don't have a case here to get executed so that is why i will go to this default case and get executed so for example let's just write the same example here of the switch case okay switch will have something called as weight let's just take this weight value variable weight is equal to so we have to parse say float thing but prompt enter your weight so we take this weight here so weight has been converted into float from string and now we are switching this weight so we write here our switch block okay the case can be you know one or the case can have you know weight can have value 2 weight can have value say 3 now whenever the value of case 1 is 3 then i will write something like you know document dot write your weight is 1 if it is 2 then i will write it as 2 or something that i want to do whatever logic that i want it to happen or work here is what i'm going to write next to the colon but if weight is 4 then nothing is going to happen because i haven't written any default case whatever i will be doing if the case is 1 if i want to do a lot many statements i will do all those and definitely make sure that i write a break statement why am i writing break statement here is that if i do not break it okay it will execute this case 1 also the next cases which are there in the line it will not check for these values later that is why it is a must that we make sure we write a break statement so let's just try to execute this it asks us for the weight and i add 4 when i add 4 there is nothing that is happening because there is no case for it so let's try to add one default case and let's try this document 1 comma 2 comma 3 that's what is the message that i will be writing so right here is 6 and it says that weight is not in 1 2 3 so this is how we make use of switch case and that is why we write a break statement so if i do not write this break statement and you can just cross check it so i comment this okay and i add 1 so that it matches my case 1 can you say that it has checked return weight is 1 as well as weight is 2 so that means even the case 2 has got executed that is why i should be writing break statement let's move on to the next that is loops loops are basically blocks of code that are to be executed for a number of times if you want to do the same task number of times it is better to go for loops in javascript 
one of the most famous look okay, which is also there in C and uh, C++ and Java is a for loop which is also there in JavaScript. It has three parts in its syntax. The first part stands for initialization, the second part stands for condition and third part for the updation. Now how does it work? In the first part when you write a for loop it initializes. So when the control reaches this for loop it will first initialize a variable to whatever value you have mentioned. If you can see it in the example here we have created a variable i and initialize it to 0. Then it checks for the condition. Now condition has to evaluate to either true or false. So if the condition is true means now here i's value is 0. It is compared with subjects.length. Now what is this subjects here? It is an array of these subjects. So if you can see that its length is 3. And yes of course 0 is lesser than 3. That means the condition is true. So without any problem for the first time it executes whatever is written within this brace bracket. Now coming back after executing this brace bracket it goes to the third part in the syntax that is updation. So it updates i's value. Now it becomes z from 0 to 1. So it checks again now the condition. Is 1 lesser than 3? Yes, of course. So it goes and executes the value. Again what happens is that it again now after executing the complete statement it goes here for the updation. Now i's value become 2. 2 is lesser than 3? Yes, of course. It gets executed. Now the i's value become 3 and 3 is not lesser than 3. So that means the condition is not getting fulfilled. It is evaluating to false boolean value. So now it will come out of the loop. This is how your for loop will get executed. Let's try to execute that for loop. So what they have done is they have created an array of subjects with three subjects okay and there is one more array which is a blank array marks so you will iterate through or traverse through this array of subjects and you will ask user for every subject to give you marks and once you give that marks you will add those marks to the newer array called as marks array let's try to go ahead and execute that So we have an array okay, called as subjects equal to, let's just write this directly, having here math, say physics. So now we have another array called as marks, but it is a blank array. We want to traverse through this subjects array. So we create initialization first variable. Any variable, say for example, j is my variable, which I have initialized to 0. Now j will go over this subjects array. So I will write this subjects array dot length. So till it is lesser than length then only it should execute. After that it shouldn't and this is my updation. So whenever j's value is 0 I want it to ask for that particular subjects marks. So what I do here is num1 so I create a variable and I initialize that variable okay parse float I ask for prompt enter marks for subject so which is that subject subject is definitely in the subjects array so I see here subjects dot j so that means for the first time for the first time the j's value will be 0 so it will ask for maths value second time it will ask for physics value so once I get these values, I will update my marks array also. So for marks j value, I will add num. So that's what I'll be doing now. Let me run this code. We see what is the error. For this, I haven't done it and one bracket is missing. Okay, let me run this again. So it asks for math, so I say 34 I've got and physics, I say 35 I have got. So my marks array has also got formed with this. So instead of using this older for loop, I can make use of something called as a newer for loop called as for in loop. What is this for in loop? In this for in loop, you use for as a keyword and in the bracket you use in keyword. Now in keyword has two sides, LHS and RHS, left hand side and right hand side. On the right hand side of this in keyword should be one array. 
or anything that you want to traverse any list of things so for example I want to see whatever marks that has got added so I want to loop through this marks so what I will do I will write on the right hand side of in the name of the array marks now every time I traverse through this marks I will reach its element 1 then its element 2 then the third element and on so I want to add that every element to a variable and then use that variable in my code so that variable will be returned here say so m is my variable so every time it goes to the zero the variable it will come in m one variable it will the value will come in m again so let's just see if I want to see console dot log marks let us see how this works. see its theory for in loop what you do is that you just take on the right hand side the list that you want to traverse and on the left hand side is one variable that variable will be every for every iteration in the for loop it will point to that current element element will always go from 0 to n minus 1 that's what I have returned let me just see if this works for me it's 45 I've got then I've got 45 again Sorry. It will be marks that is the name of the array and its index. So that index will have the value. So 67 and 34. So I'll get both these values here. Okay. So that is how my for in loop works. So for and in on the right hand side is your list and here is your index. So for every index in this, okay, you can drop, okay, or talk to that element or see that element on the screen. So this was your for in and for loop. Let us move on to the last two loops that is while loop and a do while loop. What is this while loop all about? A while loop is something as the name suggests while this condition holds true it will execute. Okay whereas what is do while loop? There's a slight difference in it. Let's see it here practically. So when you write here a while loop, you write your condition here. So as long as this condition is true, this piece of code will get executed. So whatever you write in this brace bracket will get executed. Unless this condition is false, okay, this will get executed. What happens in a do while loop? You can see that your task to be executed is written after do or it is written before only whereas the condition is tested later that's exactly what happens in do while loop so for the first time it just executes this code without even checking the condition and for the second iteration it checks if the condition is true only if the condition is true then only this executes for the second time but by default it will execute for the first time that is the difference between while loop and a do while loop so for example I create a variable here as i is equal to 8 and I say that till i is lesser than 10 while i is lesser than 10 okay I want to execute this seeing that console.log okay and i's value now i is equal to 8 so i will be forever lesser than 10 so this loop will keep on getting executed infinite times this is called as an infinite loop if you want to make it finite there should be a code that will increment 8 slowly and make it greater than 11 then only this loop will break so let's write the piece of code i++ here so slowly what will happen is that i will become 9 then also 9 is lesser than 10 so this will get executed slowly I will become 10 okay then 10 is not lesser than 10 so it will come out of this loop so now currently i's value will be 10 let us write the condition the same condition here i is lesser than 10 and let's write the same logic console.log let's try to execute both these loops okay so now can you see that 8 is lesser than 10 9 is lesser than 10 but 10 is not lesser than 10 still it has got executed and why so because when i's value was 10 it came out of this loop but it got executed in this do while loop now the 10 it just checks 10 is not lesser than 10 so for the second time i this do loop will not get executed 
So that is the difference between while loop and a do while loop. Make sure that whatever condition that you put shouldn't be an infinite condition. If it is an infinite condition, your code will keep on running. So this was about the while loop. Same example we have written in while loop. So what we have done is while i is less than subjects dot length, we will ask for the marks in the subject, but we'll make sure that i plus plus is happening, increment is happening, and we want to see marks of all the subjects. And again, i less than subject dot length. Okay, and then you just write a message using an alert. Okay, you give this variable message as subject is so and so and marks you have received is so and so. So do while loop, the syntax do change. First we write do keyword, then the condition to be executed and then the while loop. So after do is the statements to be executed and after while the condition. Okay, so in do while loop without even checking the condition, at least once the block will get executed. So as I said that what you mean by function is bundling together the statements that you want or can put them a label. Now how do we write this function? A function will have a particular syntax. If you follow that syntax, then only it will be called as function in JavaScript. So let's learn the syntax. Function has something called as a keyword called as function. How do we write a function? So we need to use the keyword function. Okay, then the name of the function, okay, since it is a function, it should be followed by this round brackets. Now in round brackets, you will send it something called as parameters, also called as arguments. And what this function will do upon calling is your body of the function, which is written always in the curly brackets. So this is basically the standard definition of how do we write function in any programming language. Now the keyword may change here the keyword is say function or the some keywords in other languages will change. But yeah, we use some keywords then the name of the function followed by this round parenthesis wherein you pass your parameters which is nothing but input given to the function. On this input this function will work. And what work it has to do will be returned in the curly brackets. So this curly bracket, whatever we write within this, okay, is called as body of the function. By knowing this basic theory, let's get back. How do we write functions in JavaScript? Now functions, a set of statements or nothing but your function body that perform a task and calculate something, a value. It is defined somewhere in the scope. So we will learn about what are scopes. It is invoked by a function call. There are two parts. You define a function and you call that function. Definition is like you just wrap it up, pack it and keep it. Whenever you want to use it, you will call it. Defining and calling are two different things. How do we call a function? So whatever I explained here is the definition of the function. If I want to call that function, Definitely what will I do is that I will use the name of that function without any case problem. It should be ditto the same name as it is here. Okay. And we'll use this round parenthesis. So this becomes calling of the function. And within this function, you will pass if the parameters required. So if you have defined your function with some parameters, I will have to send those parameters. Okay, if I don't send the parameters by default undefined value will be sent to the parameters. Okay, so this is called as calling of the function and the above part is called as nothing but your definition of the function. What are function parameters? A function parameter is a value which is accepted by the function. Nothing but input that is passed to the function. Parameters in a function call are arguments. Arguments are parameters which are passed to the function by value. So whatever value that we pass okay, to the function during the function call are then copied into the function's variables, whatever variables we define. I will get back to that with a proper example. Before that, let's complete our function definition here. What is a return statement? 
Every function should have a return statement in its body, which returns a specific value. It's kind of a must in your JavaScript. If a function does not have a return statement, a default value is returned. And the default value that is returned is nothing but undefined. Okay, so this is how you write your function, you call your function and while writing your function you should make sure that you write a return statement. If you don't, then by default it will give you something called as undefined back. Okay, now how do we write functions in JavaScript? Well, there are four ways of writing a function. So on the way how it is returned or defined, functions are categorized in JavaScript. So there are various ways of defining a function, various ways of calling that function, etc. So there are altogether categories that are made are four named functions, anonymous function, self-invoking function and constructors. Okay, so let us understand if we want to write a small function, how do we write that function as a named function? How do we write the same function as an anonymous function? How do we write the same function as a self-invoking function or as a constructor? Okay, now as you can see the terms, they are self-explanatory basically. Named functions are like, you know, functions having some or the other name. Anonymous function means they do not have any name. Self-invoking function, now what is this? As I told you, definition of the function is different and calling of the function is different. Calling is nothing but invoking a function. So the function which calls itself is called as a self-invoking function. And final are your constructors. So if you are well versed with other object oriented languages like Java, you would understand what exactly are constructors. Okay, so we will see each one of this category in detail. First are your named function. A function should have always a unique name. So if there are two, four, five named function, they all should have unique name. Okay, you can once define this named function, you can call this named function at multiple places. Okay, you can call them n times, 10 times, any number of times. Okay, there is no restriction over it. Okay, so let's see how they have defined a named function. Let's see at the example. The name of the function here is, if you can just notice, function is a keyword in JavaScript followed by add num. So it is the name of the function followed by round parenthesis in which there is a comma separated list of some characters or some variable names something like a b c d whatever so what does this mean these are your parameters okay now you don't write something like where a where b no you just write the name of the variable so implicitly one variable is already created with the name as a Another variable is created with a name as B. Remember that you never declare your variables in this parenthesis. You just write the name of the variable. The declaration is taken care by the browser or the JavaScript part. Now follows, once the parameter list is created, okay, then you go ahead and you write the function body. And the function body, what you write is return A plus B. So which means that whatever inputs are coming to this function, you're just adding both of them and sending the summation result back. If this return statement was not there and if I had called this function add num, I would have got undefined as the answer. Okay, so let us see how do we create our named function. So we have our uh, module 1's example with operators and data types with JavaScript. Let's create one more JavaScript now called as functions. Difference that we will notice here is that yes, whatever module one's JavaScript files which were added, okay, they were like this. We had just added them. And after adding all the code in this JavaScript tag, okay, in our HTML, we just added them. 
So whenever the control would find that, okay, the script has been added, it goes to this particular file and start executing from statement one. But now we won't be doing that way. It is not the execution that should start. There'll be some kind of declaration and then the execution will take place. Okay. So what we will be doing is that though this is also a JavaScript file, we will not directly write in the code that needs to be executed. Rather, we will write all that code that needs to be executed as a part of a function and we will call that function instead. So let's try to create our first function which is a named function and let's see how it reacts. So the keyword that we need to write is function then the name of the function is say add number okay in bracket how many numbers do you want to add so a and b say, for example write the body part of it. So in the body part as mentioned one return statement is a must. So that's what we have done. So we have called this add num. Okay, we have declared. So our declaration part has been done. So only declaration will never call it. I try to use this function.js and try to add it here. So name of our file is functions. So I've added the script file. Whenever this HTML will get loaded, even this file will get loaded. And yes, I have defined this function. So let me try to hit the... So this has happened. If I just see in the sources, yes, my functions.js has got added. But yeah, nothing is happening. Okay, let's try to add some console part here, saying that console.log add num is called. Let's see if I get some console output. And I see that there is no output. If I refresh also, no output. In the last module, what used to happen was that whenever I used to load the script, it would just start executing. No restrictions at all. But currently what I've done is that these statements, okay, which I want to get executed, I have clubbed them together, okay, in a function. Unless and until I call this function, this will not get executed. Okay. So once my function declaration is done, now I will try to call this function. So here I would send 2 comma 3 and this is a call to this function. So I just send this name of the function followed by the parameters. So here what happens now A is equal to 2 and B is equal to 3. So if I just hit this, now my console statement will get executed. So now you'll be like waiting for the answer like 2 plus 3. But that is what is return as a value. But I have not logged the value as of now. Neither I have caught it in a variable. Okay. So let me log whatever is the output of this method. That I get it as 5. What if I do something like this, you know, I don't even say, I just say A plus B and I don't write this return statement and I try to hit it. Can you see that I get the answer as undefined? It is because by default undefined value is returned by this function. So this is how we write our named function and that is why we require our return statement. I may also write, take the value that is return, okay, in the sum variable and call this method instead. And now I can log this sum variable. So can you see that as many times I am calling this function, those many times this function gets executed. If I call it one more time, okay, without any reference, Again, the console statement will get executed three times. So this is how we write our functions. Or rather, this is how we write our named functions. Moving to the next part of the function, that is, how do we declare anonymous function? As the name suggests, it is anonymous. It doesn't have a name. Now, you'll be surprised, like, if you don't have a name, how we call it? 
So sometimes we don't require a function to be named because we don't want to call it again and again. At that point we will not create any name for that function. Or rather JavaScript provides a specialty to write a function without a name. Okay? So let's try to learn how do we create anonymous functions. So since they do not have any name, they can be used only at one place. Okay? When it is called immediately after it is defined or actual argument to the function or function defined is used as an expression, it can be stored in a variable passed as an actual argument to a function or can be returned as a value by function. This all points may sound Greek to you. But let's see the examples. Now, can you see that a function has been defined? So, the keyword function exists. Only the name is missing, but the rest of the syntax remains the same. That is the parameters of the function and the body of the function. So it's perfect, it is returned. So that means one function has been declared. Well, there is no name. So what we can do is, we can assign this function to a variable. So we have stored this in the variable. Now if we want to call this function, you can use this variable name instead. And using this variable name, if you want to pass any arguments, then you may add this parenthesis and add this parameters. This is one way of doing it. So you want to use it again and again. So the solution for that is you may assign it to a variable. So this is stored in a variable. Sometimes it so happens that any of your functions are defined in such a way that one of its argument or parameter is of the type function. If that is the case, you may give one name of the function or you may create a function on the fly. For example, there is a method in JavaScript which is a global method that we have not developed but JavaScript has given us this method and the name of the method is setTimeout method. What does this method do? It, this method takes up two parameters. First parameter is a function to be executed and second parameter is nothing but a number that is time to sleep in millisecond. So what this function does is that this function will execute its first parameter which is nothing but a function only after some time is gone or some time is already ticked and that time is your second parameter. So this is how the set timeout function is created. So in such methods wherein your parameters are your functions, you can define your anonymous function. So these are the two ways you can create your anonymous function. Let's try to see it's practical. Say the same function I create named function add name is called. Okay, so here we will write a console log saying that anonymous. Okay. Now tell me something, can I call this function now the way I used to call this function here by just using its name? It is simply not possible. So what do I do is I add a variable here, anonymous function. Now I want to call this function, so how do I go about it? I just say anonymous and this. Let me try it, okay, with the variables as 5 comma 6. Let us try to hit it. Can you see that the anonymous function is called? What have I done? I have created an anonymous function. I have assigned its value to a variable. This is how we can use this anonymous function or make it useful by adding it to the variable. As we have seen one example that was set timeout. So set timeout is a function which is a global function. It takes up two parameters. If you just see here, the two parameters are like function and second is the delay that should take. Okay, like after so many milliseconds then only this function will get executed. So either in this you can write this anonymous function name and the timeout say for example 300 millisecond this function will get executed or you can define your function here as a part of this parameter. So in this you can just have you know a console.log saying that it is anonymous function 
call in set timeout. Okay, so what does set timeout will do? When the control reaches here, it will check that, okay, it has to pause for 3000 millisecond and after that it should call execute this function. Let's see if this works for us. So after 3000 millisecond, then a call to this goes. So this is how we have written a function as a parameter to another function. So this is the second use of anonymous function. So we have learned now two ways of declaring a function. One was named function, another is anonymous functions. Moving on to the third type that is constructors. What are constructors? Basically, in object-oriented paradigm, constructors are special functions and we have already used this constructor before when we had declared an array. While using your constructor or calling your constructor, you use a keyword that is called as new. This new keyword is followed by what type of object do you want to create. Now, if you want to create an object of the type array, then you would say new and array. And you will make sure that array word has a capital. Similarly, if you want to use or create an object of the type function, then you would use the keyword new and the object that you want to create is function, right? So F will be capital. Now, after declaring this function, how do we write its proceeding? Like where do we write its parameters? Where do we write its body? So everything is a part of that function and that parenthesis that we write. If you can see this in the example, we have created a new function type. So new function, F is capital. Then you start writing your parameter list. Every parameter you write is nothing but the string value. So as many parameters you want, you can write those many variable names separated by comma and at last you can write its body. So in the body what is return is return a plus b okay and a semicolon. So you can write as many statements as you want as its last parameter or its last parameter is nothing but the body of the function. This is as good as writing like variable add function is equal to function a comma b okay and your body has written a plus b. So this is how you write your constructor. That means you're creating a type. So this is the syntax using constructors. Let us see it's working using constructors. So you will have new, then function, and this is what you will be writing. Now within this function, you will have your parameter list. Now if your parameter list has got over, write last parameter as the body of this function. You will not include anything like curly braces, nothing. Within double quotes, you will write the body of the function. So if you want to write something like, you know, console.log in constructor function. So maybe it is double quotes are getting ended up here. Let's try with the single quotes here semicolon okay and then you say return a plus b so this is the body of your function return a plus b and this function that you have created definitely it is an anonymous function that got created so you have to write if you want to use it you'll be adding it to nothing but constructor or any variable that you will create now if you want to call this function you will just say constructor along with that you will pass the function values same as you do for anonymous function you can log whatever is the output of this function or you can take it in another variable okay so I am in the constructor function okay and this is the output in the constructor function and 3 plus 5 is equal to 8 so this is the way to create one more anonymous function but using new constructor. So let us see the last way of creating a function called a self-invoking function. As the name suggests, 
the function that gets invoked by itself or a call uh, you call yourself okay that is what is called a self invoking function now what is the self invoking function these functions are anonymous functions which are invoked right after the function has been defined you can execute the code once without declaring any global variable no reference is maintained to this function not even its return value now how do we write this function is that you write the function definition completely it is an anonymous function so like the way we write our anonymous function we will be writing this but after the function has got over you will just call it to call it what do we do for a named function you just write the name of the function and then two round brackets if any parameters are required you pass the parameters if no parameters are required then you don't pass anything but calling means writing that function name and then adding or appending the round parenthesis so that's exactly what you will be doing you will just call this function by just appending round parenthesis open and close that's exactly is called as self invoking function okay so there's a function like this say function within which you write nothing but an alert but you want to call this function so you will just write nothing but two round brackets to invoke it let's see the example here self invoking function so we have created nothing but a function function keyword you write here a comma b okay you just say that it is returning a plus b and that's it so your function definition is over now you want to call it so you just append nothing but this two parentheses and in this parenthesis you may write some value so this will be invoked to check whether it is getting invoked or not let's just write a console inside in self invoking function so this is how we write the self invoking function let's see if it works i am in the self invoking function and it has just call the self invoking function what is important is the round parenthesis okay you may write it here or you may just end it even outside like the way we have seen in the presentation so you can end it outside the call or just before the call okay so this as a complete entity okay it takes up and after this complete entity has been returned you can just write this round parenthesis so all the four parts have been covered up like how do we create a named function anonymous function a new constructor function and finally a self invoking function so let us just go to the one more example like to calculate the square of a number how do we calculate it so we can write here as you can see create one javascript file that is to calculate square of a number in that we can write a function okay saying that it is a square of a number which will return nothing but multiplication to itself product of itself so that will give us the output so let's try to use all those four types in this calculating the square of a number this was functions dot javascript let's create one more javascript file let's save this as calculate square dot javascript so we will be creating nothing but all four types of function so let's go with the first one named function here so the first function is function it is named so let's write n and calculate square it takes up a single number and returns back product of itself okay so we have already declared this named function now it's time to call this function so let's just write this console dot log and just write a statement calling named function and let's just call this function well along with this function we will send a value Now since we have created a new JavaScript file, we need to add it in the script tag. So let's just comment this one, as we'll be confused with the output that we get. 
let's just add one more script tag. See the naming convention, whatever you have used is right. Try to load this file. Okay, and once you load this file, the function gets called and you get the output. Okay, now to call or to create one anonymous function. So let's just create an anonymous function. Call as, just take a number, say P, and just return back P into B. Make sure that you assign it to a variable, say A, calculate. So this is how we write anonymous function. Try to call this with the console.log. Here you will be calling anonymous function and call this variable instead. And to this variable you give a value say 6. Let us see if this gets called. Yes, the anonymous function is also getting called. So let's try to calculate square using new constructor. So to calculate your square using constructor, what do we use is a new keyword with the function f capital. Now everything that is to be returned in the function may be body or the parameter, everything should be pushed okay, as a parameter. So first let's write the parameter list, well, how many parameters do we require? It's just a single one, so add our parameter then the last parameter will be nothing but the body of the function. So you'll be writing return a into a. So this becomes the body of the function. Okay, and this is your parameter. Since it is an anonymous function, let's just mark it or add it or assign it to a variable. Let's try to see in the log whether it gets run properly. So you write a message calling constructor function and let's just pass a value to it. Let's see if it gets called properly. So we get calling constructor function 49. So this is how we call a constructor function and let's go to the last one that is self invoking function. To create this self invoking function First you create your function with f small as always only in the new constructor f is capital. You add the value whose square you want to calculate. Okay, write its body. So your function is now ready. So you want to invoke it. So to invoke it definitely you will be calling itself by passing a value 9. Okay, so let's try to write in the body of the function, okay, one console statement calling self-invoking function. So this is how it looks, this is your function and this is the body of the function with its first statement, then its second statement and there here the body ends and this is where you call the function. So let me run and I get the final function as well. And since it just returns the value and it doesn't even write the output, okay, what we can do is we can write here the output or we can write this complete function in console.log. Okay, so a simple program but you can use four different ways of writing functions. As and when you require need of any type of function, you can use that. If you want name function, you can go for it. Anonymous function, you can go for it. New constructor, you can go for it. And self-invoking function, you can go for it. Okay. So that's where we complete the practical part of functions. So we will be now moving towards memory management in JavaScript. As we can see that the function, how it is written here is I created a squared function and that JavaScript is linked in this HTML and to execute this function we have used alert box instead of console.log in the example which we have seen you can also use something called as alert okay and then you calculate the square of a number okay and just display its output on the screen. What are closures are it is an implicit permanent link between the function and its scope chain as I told you. 
we won't be able to see what exactly is a scope chain. But there is something called as a scope chain that exists which means that to which outer scope it refers to. A function's definition, hidden reference, is what a scope is. Okay? It holds the scope chain. It is used and copied as an outer environment reference anytime the function is run. We saw an example of closure in the previous slide where local memory of F is not garbage collected even when there is no way to access F. Let us just see a small example here that will help us to understand closures. Okay, so I've created a function. The function's name is, it is an anonymous function, having a variable. So this is variable which is declared in this function. Plus it has one more function which is returned back. The same way we had function g which was returned back by the function f. Similarly, we have one more function here which is returned back and it can access the outer scope that is counter. So same example as that we have seen but just some name changes. Now this whole function is added to a variable add like the way we had my g variable. So that is what I have added. I have self invoked this function and whatever will be the output will be added to this variable add. So let's add this closure.js to my function HTML file. Let us reload this file. Let's see in the sources closure has got added. So we have a variable which has self invoking function. Now the function has a variable of its own and it returns another function's output and that function actually uses the function that is defined in the outer scope. So let's try to call this add function. Okay, in this add function, I can see that initially the counter was zero. I call it once again, the counter is still increasing. Now why this has happened? Let me try to see this and show you this closure. There's something called as scope which has a closure within it and closure has all this data. So now if we open up, this is my outer function. If you just imagine it to be a universal set. Say so this is my outer function. Outer functions will have some memory, some variables. Okay, and this outer function actually returns back, returns back one more function, which is an inner function. Now this inner function uses the variables that are declared outside. Okay, and this is what gets returned. I make sure that this outer function is referred by one global variable. A global variable which points to this outer function. So in such a scenario what happens is that and whenever I call this global variable, I will call this function for the first time. So see if this value is 0 now. I call this function one more time. At that time what happens is that the control directly jumps onto this inner function which takes up the value which was existing here as 0. Okay? Once it becomes 1, it will take that 1 value. It will not again remake it as 0. So it's not a start from the outer function. Why? Because the scope of this points to this one instead of outer function now. Okay, so that's what has happened here. If you can see that the counter has become 8. So every time I call this add function, the counter will increase. Why? Because whatever is the newest change, okay, that gets added to the scope, this variable, you can imagine this variable to be not a part of this and it gets copied here. Okay. And every latest value that has got changed, it gets incremented. Okay. This is how closures work. So when you have a global variable pointing to a function, which in turn returns one inner function that accesses the outer functions variable, then those outer function variables become a part of that inner function and they don't get initialized every time you call this global variable.
This is a closure. You can create something like variable name and get that data here. But now one more variable will come up. So variable age. So some age will be put in. Say variable address. Some address will be put in. Basically all this data, logically if you think about this data, it belongs to a single entity. Maybe a user or a person we will call it. But we have three different variables now. If you go to use array then it is nothing but a collection of homogeneous data type. So if you have many names you can put together and create an array out of it. Okay, But in case you have different different type of data and logically it represents one entity then JavaScript helps you with something called as JSON object stands for JavaScript object notation or in simple terms an object can be created using JavaScript. So I can put all this data under one name and that's what an object is all about. Okay? And we will be learning also about event handling. What is an event? There are many events that do take place when we load a page. We have a button upon clicking one event gets generated. When I type into an input box one more event gets generated. So there are many events that get generated. So being a smart developer why shouldn't I take an opportunity and take an advantage of such events? On occurrence of certain events I can do some task. So that's exactly what we are going to learn today. How do we create an object? As I told you object is nothing but it is logically all the data that belongs to one entity is put together under one name. And there are around almost six types we can declare an object or we can create an object. Now one more thing as we speak about object, object in any language may it be JavaScript, may it be Java or may it be .NET or any language that we work with. Objects usually are something real life entities and we have some specific parts that are declared. So let me just explain you that basics once. An object has something called as properties. What are properties? Now if I say that human is one object. So human has many properties like he has eyes, tongue, nose, hands, legs etc. So whatever the entity possesses or whatever the entity has becomes its property. In the second part it usually have something called as methods or functionalities which means that what that entity can do. Properties is what it possesses and what it can do forms its methods. So a human being can talk, human being can walk, can run, can do programming. So all this becomes its functionality. So this is what all it can do. So basically you have two parts. One is the property and other is methods. That's how you should be designing your object. So the ways of creating this object we will see now in a short while. Now we will tell you that properties, whatever property an entity possesses, usually you can access all those properties of that entity or that object. How do you access that property? Using a dot notation. For example, if a human being has you know name as one property. So for this object whose name is human, you can use this name property using human a dot operator, a dot operator which is a must and then the property name. So using a dot property you can access all its properties. That is what is very very important. Okay. So without taking a minute let's learn how do we create our object. Okay. To create our object like the way we used new operator while creating function we can use this new operator to create an object as well. So 
as I told you, for anything you have to declare that variable with the keyword as VAR. So that rule also is strictly followed here. So if you just can see in the example, we have created a variable whose name is person and using this new operator, we created an object. So perfect, using this first line of code, we have created one blank object. Now it's time to add some properties to it. So what we can do is we can define person.name is equal to say Saya. Okay, and age is so and so. So we've added two properties to this object. Okay, let's try to create this object. So let's create a new file. Let's save that as object dot js okay and in object dot js let's try to create an object using new operator so whenever you use this new operator remember that if you use it for a function or an object make that f and o capital that is what is very very important so let's try adding its properties saying that Say designation is a trainer, okay, person dot say phone number, it should be something like this, a number. So yes, uh, my object is totally ready, I have created an object here, okay. Now if we want to push all this in a function also, that is also a great idea, something like, you know, function create person if this is my function a named function I can just put all this data in this function make sure I indent it let me see so my function is ready here I can call this function now and using this function I can create a person okay so in this what has happened is this function will return me back the person definitely and I can take up nothing but it's like a factory I have created so whenever I want to create an object of the type person with these as the properties I will call this create person method so that's what I have done let me use it in my HTML page the name of the file is object.js Let's first see whether it gets um, called, yeah. In the sources, is that got attached? Perfect. So, I have not printed anything, so I can just say console.log here and just say that whatever is the value of this variable, let me print that. And yes, I get the object completely with designation, name and phone number and its type is nothing but object. So this is how I have created my object using new operator. So instead of this new object, we can just write these two curly braces and it will work the same. Because instead of writing new object, if you write just these two curly braces, that means you have created a blank object, okay? The type, if you just type in type of person, it will be always an object because you have initialized it to a blank object. And similarly, you can give an attribute to this object. So, uh, maybe you can just copy this and say person2, wherein what you're doing is using this object. Okay, and here you will just write in 2 and the same thing okay the same variable will now point to create person to function so that's what we'll be doing and if you just type in the same thing and now it is pointing to Gauri 2 so what is the change that has been done is nothing but we've created a person using this brace bracket so this third way of creating an object so you can use the same way that is using curly braces create your object but giving a property to that object okay not only use a dot notation but we can use something called a square brackets like the way we use for arrays and within that in single quote please write your property 
So this is the second way of adding your property. So now let us try to create the third way of creating a person. The name would be 3 and here instead of this dot notation you would be typing in something like this. It's like name. You would be typing in here designation. Okay, same thing phone number. So this is one more way of writing it. You can also write something like this. You can create an alert saying that, okay, let variable Gauri point to this third function, okay, and let it have Gauri 3 as the name. And I want to now access this name, okay, saying that it is the name attach the value then using concatenation operator let me write its designation attach the value using the object name then the phone number so this is what all the data instead of doing console.log let me see that if I get the alert of this so let me run this and I get the alert saying that name is Gauri 3, designation is so and so and phone number is so and so. So we have seen that the alert gives us all the details. So we can see all the details using console.log. Okay, well we can write that console.log in the JS file of ours or directly on the console. Okay, so here we can even type in like this and type in Gauri, it will give you the thing. So you need not write here console.log because actually you are logging onto the console. So just type in what you want to log and it will give you the result. So these were the some ways of logging and this was the third way of creating your object. Well we just saw that two ways of creating properties. One is using the dot operator and another was using the square bracket. Now instead of creating a blank object at the start we can fill in all the property name and the value of it like this separated by a colon so every property doesn't have quotes it is the property whereas the value has quotes if it is of the type string if it is a number directly the value so let's just see this fourth type of creating an object so here instead of this I'll be creating an object like this. So name is the first property you can just type in 4 comma another property say age 60 then say designation trainer comma this was also a comma and phone number say. So I've created an object like this directly while declaring this object. So initialization and declaration has happened in one statement. I am returning that person here. So let me just say 4 and let me now see if this works for me. So online, whenever you are ending that object, do not write a comma or any semicolon. That's a must. Now let's see what variable Gauri has. It has 40, age is 60, designation is trainer. So basically here it just renders the value based on uh, you know alphabetical order. Age, designation, N and then P. Now object creation using a function now which we have already done but a bit different. You can create something like a function which creates an object but how? The function will have a name. It will be definitely a named function. And what will be the body of that function will be nothing but the properties of that object. Now, properties of this object will be always preceded with a keyword called as this. And what does this mean? This means the current object that you are creating. Like the way we have in many object oriented languages called as a constructor. So if anybody is a Java developer, they would directly feel that, okay, this is something like creating a constructor. 
So you can create a constructor and that constructor is nothing but your function in JavaScript wherein you create the name of the function and the body of the function will have all its properties initialized. So all these properties will always have a keyword this which means that the current object that you are creating. So this dot name, so current object which you are creating just add a property name to it. The current object you are creating just add a property age to it. So once your constructor is ready, your object doesn't get created unless this constructor or this special function is called. And to call this special function, you have to use operator called as new. So new and then the name of the function. Simply if you just call this function, it will not create an object. You have to use the keyword new for it. So let's use this create our constructor function. The constructor function is a simple function maybe with a name as this dot name five semicolon then this dot designation trainer this dot age something like 90. So you have this function ready. Now understand that after this function is ready, you have to call it only using the new operator. So your variable Gauri will have something like new person. Well, if you just see, it gives you a type forward that, okay, whatever you have declared right now, is of the type you know class and you can create an object out of it the class object concept because you're using the operator new here so this will assign it the newer values if you just see if this is working for you and you type in Gauri here you will see that yes one more object has got created okay that is person with these values okay so let's just see the next way that is sixth way of creating your object. So using nothing but the type object dot create method. So you'll be just creating an object basically and uh, the object would be like using brace bracket you have just made one object. So here if you see in the example the object variable name is animal which has property type. Type has a value in vertebrates. Now it has one more method that is displayed. So that's the way we will be now getting introduced to how do we add method to an object. Same as that of the property, you just have to write the name, okay, that is the method name separated by or assign it nothing but a function. So display type is one method, okay, which is assigned to a function. And what that function does is nothing but it just says that it gives you an alert that the type is so and so, this dot type. So it accesses all its property and gives you the value. Now, using this particular variable, I can just say variable animal and display it. It will definitely give me an object. What if I want to create using this variable more and more objects? So using object that is with O capital, okay this particular object dot create method and to this create method we give this variable name it will create one more copy of that object if I want to create one more time call this create method one more time and you can change the property as you want let's try to use this object dot create method to create our object so what it says is it has created nothing but a variable say animal which is equal to pure object creation. So in which it just said that type is equal to invertebrates. This is how we have written its property, comma. Now we want to write something called as a method of it. So let the method be like this. Initialize that method to a function. And what that function does? Nothing but alert the type of it type is what is the type whatever is the type of this particular object it will be typed in so current object is always denoted by this keyword so this is a function which you have added to this display type 
So simple as the way we have created here name, age, designation, okay, all properties separated by a comma. Similarly, we just added one more property name, but to that we initialized it to a function like this. Now, if we want to create many objects using this, this particular prototype, how do we go about it? So, I can create something like variable, say, horse is equal to, I want to create it of the type animal. Okay, so I use something as object.create method. So, I've created a horse using this animal type. Let us see if this works for us. And let me see what horse has. So, it has an object of the type so and so. And its type value is this. Whereas display type is a value which is a function. Okay, it also has a constructor. It also has, you know, scopes and its type. So, this is what gets created. If I just type in, so I get its property. Okay, that is type and display type. Okay, display type is a method, whereas type is one property. And this is the extra information in the prototype object that we have. So, as many, now after creating horse, okay, I want to change its type. Definitely, I can go ahead and change its type to something else. I can type in like this. And just say, and say horse. The value has already changed, okay? So, that is what is important that I can definitely go ahead and change its type whenever I want. Or using that object, I can call its method also, okay? I can call its method by using this object, which is like dot display type. Since it is a method, let's call it. So, I will say and type is something else. Okay, so this is how using object.create method you can give a prototype or can create as many objects as you want and later on change its properties, call its methods, etc. Like the way we do for other object oriented languages. If you want to create an object and after creating an object, if you want to delete any of its property, then it's simple. There is a keyword called as delete. Okay and will delete that object's property. Like the way we have here a person that object is got created. Now, if you want to iterate through every property of this person, you can use our for in loop. As I told you, in the in operator, if you're using, on the right hand side of the in operator, you write the list that you want to iterate through and in the left hand side will be its index. So, its index here are nothing but name, age, weight, etc. So, that's what comes in the properties then, okay, and delete one of its property and then again just see, okay, after deleting the property, do we have all those properties still there or not? So, let us try to execute this piece of code that we have. So, we have here Gauri as the one person, okay, that got created. Even we have here person. Let's create one more object. Variable trainer equals to this. So, variable trainer has various properties. The name of the trainer, say ABC, comma, uh, subjects. Maybe subjects is nothing but the arrays it takes up. Math, okay. Then, say, physics, then chemistry, something like that, comma, then uh, teaches, maybe teaches is a one property, it teaches who all, okay, so maybe, you know, first years, then, uh, you know, second years, only two years, it takes up, age is one property, say 60, and so and so, this is a variable or this is a trainer object that got created, okay, if I want to iterate through this trainer, and I want you to write console.log all the properties that it has. Okay. What I can do is, you know, to get the value of this property, I can just say trainer.name, trainer.subject, trainer.teaches, trainer.age. 
But if I just want these values, like all the properties it has, what we can do is you can use something like a foreign loop. For foreign loop, say P is in, okay, this trainer. Okay, create a variable called as properties, say. And to this property, you keep adding nothing but this value P. So while adding this P, just add a space the way we have added the space. Just a space is added here. Okay, so that every property is separated by a space. Or you can have a space as well as one colon. So that will make it neater. And let's try to log these properties that we have. Let's see if this works for us. Let's run this. So first it has name, then subjects, then teaches, and then age. So previously the value of properties is undefined, right? So then only after undefined it gets something like name. So you can even make it like, you know, null or something. Let's see that undefined goes off or not. It gets null as the value or it should have something like a blank, a blank string. Here, you get a neater output. Okay, so let's try now deleting a property. Delete trainer dot age. Okay, so that's what we have done. Use the keyword delete and then using the name of the object dot the property. Now let us see after deletion what is the value in that properties. Does it change or does it remain the same? So this is before deletion and this is post deletion. The name is trainer. You can just copy this here so that there won't be any problem. Now after deletion in the property, we haven't gone through the loop of this property. So whatever was there in this variable has remained as is. After deletion, if I go through the same thing as that here, let me now see what comes as the output. Before that, let me just clear this properties. Let me again initialize it to blank value. Can you see that? After deletion, the age has gone. So in the properties, it doesn't remain. So this is how you can delete a property of a variable. So that is where we have come to an end. How do we create an object? How do we access its property? How do we access its methods that are given to us? So we can change all these properties using the methods we can define some methods within the object to change the properties like we had type we had a method display type we can have one more method called as change type and in change type we can just change its type as well so we can alter all the property using its own methods also so this is how we create an object this is how we create properties of objects and then the methods of the object now after learning this bigger topic like objects, there are some objects which are ready made given to us out of which we have already seen an object called as document which is ready made given to us. Okay, we haven't created that and that document object has many methods got defined which we'll be covering at the end of the session. Similar to that, we have one more object that is also given by the browser to us. And the name of that object is window object, which is also called as browser object model. Let's see its hierarchy, how it looks like. So if you want to do something, some changes related to the window you see. Okay, currently when you open up your HTML, you see a window, right? Now that window, if you want to alter something, do some changes to this window, you need to have some APIs with you that will help you to do that. By API, I meant some methods or some means to do some alteration to that window. So here it is. We have a window object ready made okay, at our doorstep. Using this object, we can do a lot of changes to the window we can see on our screen. Let's understand its hierarchy. This window object that we have, okay, 
has many other objects or you can say some children which are associated with it. Like there is a location object which we can access. Okay, location object basically is there for, you know, locating your window or locating one of your element, etc. There is one more object called as history object which is also there in association with window object. There's document object, there's navigator object and screen object. If you can think about it, okay, you just have to visualize it like this. As window is one bigger object which is there with us, we have many properties which are associated with it. Something like, you know, location. So this is one property with it. Then document is one property with it. Then uh, history, navigator and screen. History is one more property of Windows object, which is again an object. Okay, navigator okay, is one more property, which is again an object. Okay, and screen is one property, which is again an object. Okay, so to access these object, what you can do is either you can use your window object dot its property name or simply the property name also will help us because that itself is one more object that has got created. So this window object has these many properties. Now again if you just go to see the document object has many of these properties like it has an images object, it has a forms object, it has you know links object so you can imagine it to be you know something like this which is again an object having its own properties wherein you have something like forms object okay then images object and so on okay so this is how your windows object will look like and this is how its hierarchy so let's get into details of each of this object and understand its basic working how it works like and what we can do using these objects or how it can help us in the look and feel of the application. So basically browser objects are nothing but your global objects. By global objects we meant we haven't created them. They are ready to use given to us by the browser or the JavaScript you can think of. They are available throughout your code. It won't be anywhere they are not available. No, they will be available throughout. So their scope is throughout your JavaScript. Then browser object model allows JavaScript code to interact with browser properties. And the image is shown below which is nothing but the hierarchy of window objects. So main object is window object. Its properties are location, history, document, navigator, screen. Document again has more properties, forms, images and links. Let's see the first object that is window object. So the first object under BOM object that is window object like a root object that we have it is again a global variable and whatever methods that it has we can call all those methods to learn how a window looks like how we can move how can we resize it okay so we can do all this with this window object like if you use window.open method it will open up a new window if you use window.close method, it will close the current window. If you use something like move to, so your window will just move to another location. But if it is a full screen, you won't even realize that slightly it has moved. If you just adjust its height and width, okay, and make it a small window, then its moving property you will be able to notice. You can resize the current window and you can do a lot more with this window object. Let's try a few things that will give us a hands-on on what exactly window object look like. So let's create a new file saying that BOM objects. Okay, resave this BOM object here. Resave this file with .javascript extension. So having this BOM object, okay. You can just say, you know, window. This object is readily available. And there are so many options that we have, you know. There is one alert function that we usually use, right? And we use it directly. 
basically this is a function with window okay using this window object you can call this function this is a method defined in the window object but we can basically use it why can we use it because window is the object that helps us to call all these methods we need not always use this object you can directly use its properties you can directly use its methods without using this window dot thing but let me show you with window dot as the syntax okay if i just say window dot open okay so this is my uh, javascript okay let me add this javascript to my html file comment this and right here add a source sources b o m uh, underscore o small objects not javascript let me run it once again can you see that it has opened up one more tab here so that is what has happened one more window got opened up if i write it in a neater way that is if i tell what all things i need here i need a blank window then i would uh, that is nothing but the url i don't give any url so it's a blank url then i would like to give it a name saying that a new window and what all features i need to add here if i want to add something like height should be equal to you know 100 comma width should be equal to 200 say and that's what i want to do so i want to open up a window of this style so let me now so this will definitely give me a window of that type let me just add a variable to it say new window okay so this is the new window that got created using this new window dot if i use something like move to and i try to move it to another place like this okay some location i gave with x and y axis let us try to see if this works for us we have a pop up blocker understand that uh, always allow this pop up blocker you can see a window that got created and it has come up always with something like you know there if you can see the window has already got created so it will not create once again if i close this then only it will create one more time okay the size also it has taken up a small size if i had given up a url here like say http colon slash slash w dot google dot com let me try this so it would have opened up nothing but google for me okay so this is how your window object looks like whose methods you can use to move that window to open up a new window to close the current window if you want to use the window whatever that window has got created right if you want to close that window so you can use this close method to close the window so let me see it has even opened it and closed it also okay if you want to close the current window which is going on so you can just say window dot close so it has closed the current window and gone back to the older window so this is how you can use window object and you can do some window related operations so let's put all this in a function so you can just say function window operations okay and within this you will write all this functions or whatever executable statements that you want to write and whenever you want to use this window operations then only you can call this window operations so every time now it will not be called so if i open up this new dot or first dot html in google chrome see it is not getting close because i haven't called the window operations okay this was about the window object that we have let's move in ahead with screen object now as i told you screen is one property of window object yes definitely you can use window dot screen but directly the screen as well you can use 
when you use directly the screen object implicitly a window object is attached to it because the current object that we are working with is nothing but window there is no need of writing this window explicitly it is the current object that we are working on so its properties you can directly access so you can use the screen object you can just you know you will get what is the width of the screen current screen okay current screen's height you will get you will get its available width okay that is nothing but uh, the width that you can see excluding the features like you know taskbar and all that available height for you what is the color that it has or um, whatever pixel depth it has so all these values you can get using the screen dot width and all these properties that this object screen has now you can even get the values you can even set the values okay so if you want to set some color you can use this color depth and set it you want to set the height you can use this height property and set it okay so if you want to see what is the detail of the screen okay you can write something within the script like i want to see all these values you know of this particular screen can you help me so using the screen object i can just see all the values that i have i can either do okay something like alert or i can even directly write here something like screen dot say available height and it gives me the available height okay now here if i just assign something like you know or um, color depth so color depth now in the elements you have this body tag i just change its color the background color maybe say aqua so i've changed its color let me see if that gives me something okay the depth of the color but screen dot just the color is there anything there is only depth of the color that we have so the depth is one number like what is the depth by which it is giving you that color we'll see these styles when we look after dom elements and every element of it okay now this is basically for the screen of it so available height is let's see and what is the normal height that we have height so we have total height of 768 but out of which some height is taken up by this task bar since it is taken up by this task bar we have available height of 728 so around 40 it has been taken up by this task bar okay so this is how our screen object will look like okay screen object will have certain width as well so this will be its width and if you want to see available width okay so total width we all have complete width available with us okay only the height is covered up by your task bars whereas the width is completely available so this is how you can use your window object you can use your screen object to get your data okay what all data it has if you just concentrate on the screen object see its apis you will be able to know like you will have certain methods also on the screen object you know to set something or you know to set some values or there'll be a lot of things that will be available okay so that you can work around and you know get in details of the screen object okay let's move on to the next window object that we have that is a navigator object now basically this navigator object that i have it is supposed to give me all the information about the browser but it so happens that this information is not that reliable as i'll show you what all output it gives us but yes javascript has made us one object which is available with us we have to do a bit of work around you know to get the right answer from this navigator object like screen object it also has many properties the properties are like you know app name app code name the platform on which it is running whether the cookie is enabled or not what is the product of this particular navigator etc so all these properties are associated with this navigator let us create and see what all properties it has so i've just shown you screen property on the console.log 
So as to just tell you that, okay, even on console you can see the properties. You can use this functions and uh, JavaScript as well. Okay, so there are two, three ways of using any property. So navigator properties. Let's create this function. In this, let us use navigator object dot app code name. So I can use something like document dot write. Okay, is a method in document dot write wherein I can write its code name. So I can write something like you know with a break and the code name. Okay, let me see if this function gets called here. So to call this function, I will have to first call it navigator. Okay, so it gives me the answer to my value that is app code name. So after knowing application code and app name, let us see on what platform or on what operating system does my browser work on. Okay, to see that, let us type in platform and using the navigator object get its property called as platform. Run this and I understand that it is Windows 32. So it is working on window platform. We'll see whether the cookie is enabled on this browser or not and also its product name. Whether cookie is enabled. Just in case if you are feeling that okay whatever is the property I have written it rightly or not to test the best place is here in the console. Use your navigator object okay using this navigator object you will get all the values which are there. So you will also get something like cookie enabled. Now if you want to again check the right answer or rather write it properly just say navigator dot say cookie and use it. So using this you can directly use the value that you have typed in and you can type it in your JavaScript. So that will make you sure that you have used the right spellings because always browser gives you type forwards. So in case you're using notepad and not some great ID this is a great trick that we can use. Whether cookie is enabled or not and what is the name of the product. So the product that I find here usually it is an array that we get. Save it and let me try to hit it. Okay. Sorry it is just the product name that I get here. So cookie is enabled yes. The product that it is using is Jekko. That's the most of the browsers will use the same thing. So if I hit this particular URL in another browser probably most of the applications have same values so I'll be able to see what is the answer. Okay so all the values on different browsers may differ but internally they must be using the same application so that is why we get these answers. There's something called as user agent as well of navigator so navigator dot user agent is one more property that it uses okay and you can see that it is giving you a series of all the user agents if I type in the same thing in say Mozilla if I want to type in okay in the console so you can type in navigator dot user agent okay so it just gives me like it is using Mozilla Jekko is the product okay and Firefox is the company but for Chrome it gives me these many values that is why this navigator object I told you is not so reliable. So if you want to find out which browser on which it is working okay may you have given this JavaScript code to one user and that user is opening your code in some of the browser and you need to know on which browser it has been opened okay then you can use this property of navigator.userAgent but smartly you will have to type in. If this user agent whatever array that you get from this user agent has Chrome word in it that means it is a Chrome browser. If it doesn't have Chrome then you go for the else statement and in else you check whether it has Mozilla. You can try such a piece of code in many other browsers and see what all differences you get and accordingly you just type in your 
code to test on which browser your user has opened up your file. So that's what is the important test case when it comes to navigator object in JavaScript. So let's move on to the next object that we have in line that is location object. Now what is this location object all about? Like any other object, location object also has some properties. That's like href, host name, path name, the protocol that I'm using. Then if you want, you have this method called as assign method. Okay, in which you can just assign some more URL and just open up another URL in the same window. Basically, whenever I say location, it refers to nothing but this location. It has to work with this location. So whenever I talk about location object, it is nothing but the address bar I'm talking about. So let us see what this location object has to say about. So I have this location object. Let's always make it a habit since we have learned functions now. Let's always put everything in location. Okay, location properties. So this location property, we can use console.log to log all the properties. So currently, what is the address bar that you want? Whatever is the output of this address bar is what you want. Let me just say what I'm printing here. Okay, href of location. That's what I want to see. So I'll use this location object and print its href property. I want to call this method. Okay, either I can call it here or I can call it in the console as well. So I have this method called as location prop. Let me call it here. Okay, so it gives me that, okay, so and so is the href that is getting called. So I can define my methods here, okay, and I can call them on the console also, just to test. Or for that matter, okay, I can even type in, you know, this complete function on this console, okay, and just say property one. So this is one more method that I have created. And I want to call this method that I've got created just by saying this. So at the runtime also I can write some JavaScript using this debugging tool. As much as possible you should try to use this debugging tool that helps us. Okay, so location.href will give you what is the current address in the address bar. Moreover, it can also give you something like, you know, who's the host. Okay, currently there is no host. It is nothing like, you know, localhost I have written or I have written google.com or anything. What is the protocol it is using? File protocol, right? So it will just see what is the protocol. It is file. Okay, because currently the protocol I'm using is file. Okay, if I open one uh, google.com, you can try to inspect here and type in something like, you know, uh, location.host that I'm using. It will give me, this is the host. Okay, the protocol I'm using is HTTP. HTTPS. Okay, so this is how I can just make sure that what is the address bar present here. Okay, more things like path name, the complete path name that you get. If you want to assign another value to this, so you can just say location. In this uh, location, you can just type in dot assign is a method. Okay, and in the method, say for example, I want to type in www.google.com. Let me see without the protocol it opens up or not. No, it doesn't. So let me put the complete URL with the protocol HTTP colon slash slash. Yeah. It has opened. So whatever operations you want to do with this address bar, you can use your location object for that. Okay. Now come to history object. History object is a beautiful object which will keep all the history. What all uh, back or the forward or whatever I had typed in last time. Okay. So all that history will be captured in this object called as history object. It has many methods like back, forward, etc. that will help us to get into what exactly was typed before or after or etc. So for example, if I want to use this history object, so I can just type in history dot, I would just say back. 
okay so back was this www.google.com which was not shown let me again hit back so back will be like the first html if i just say forward so it'll give me that not found page again if i hit forward it'll give me google Docs. so this is how you can use your history object just to traverse through what all objects were you know what all pages were displayed before or after or it's something to do with your history of surfing on this particular browser so that can be covered up using this history object so these were all the beautiful window objects we have covered up so far with location, navigator, history, and then there was window object, then there was a screen object, etc. Along with that, I even showed you like how do we use console.log and document.write which we can cover up. How do we define some properties or methods in this console and call them? If you are unaware of the properties of any object, directly type that object in your console and get the right name with the right spelling, copy them and paste them in your JavaScript. Your JavaScript will never give you any error. So these were some of the tricks discussed during understanding of this browser object model. And now let's get into the best or important object that we have already covered up a bit of it, that is document object model. I had already drawn a picture in my first module saying that document, imagine it to be a bucket having all the elements that you have added to your body part or rather everything right from the HTML. Everything is there in your document object. So there is one more object that is available which also we have used in our module one. Okay, so that is your document object. It has absolutely everything okay that we write in our HTML file so let's see the HTML DOM is a standard object model and programming interface for HTML it defines the HTML elements as objects the properties of all HTML elements the methods to access all HTML elements so it has some properties that will help you to get that particular object also you have methods to get any of these HTML elements and every element will have some events attached to them. Document object model of the page is created by the browser and when a page is loaded at that very point it is created. The HTML DOM object is constructed as a tree of object like this. So the HTML DOM object tree looks like first object is say document is your object within that the main element root element is HTML within root element there are two sub elements head and body within head you might have elements like title within body you may have many elements like say anchor tag or you know can have h1 tag or you can have something like input tag you can have a button but now understand that all these elements that you have in the body tag for example you have a button tag now button itself is one element so element consider that element as an object only because that element will have some properties associated with it so button can have a text it can have you know color or it can have many things along with the properties it has something called as events that is what is very very important so let's understand our document object so this is our document object in the document object okay you will have you can access each and every element say this is your head part okay and this is your body part okay within body part you can have many elements like you can have a button understand this button carefully once you get this element it will have many properties associated with it its look its feel whatever text it has so look and feel comes under styling of this whatever text it has it will have some text to it attached the text will be also considered and one more thing that is attached to it are nothing but your events so these are the three important things which are associated with 
every element you get in your document object using your document object if I get an input box also there is something that is associated with it it's styling whatever text you add in it and plus some events which are associated with it what are events now button is clickable right so there'll be one event okay which will get fired when I click this button not only clicking the button if I just move my mouse over it, there'll be one event that will be there. If I take away my mouse from that button, again, there'll be one event that will get fired. So understand that behind the scene, okay, behind your browser, there are these events which are occurring every time, every time you work on that browser window. And all these events are registered. And now we have to smartly make use of all these events. That is what is our task. Okay, so let us understand browser very neatly or rather DOM object very neatly. Whenever we make use of this DOM object model, okay, so document object model plus the JavaScript, we will be able to create something called as dynamic HTML on the client side. We can change all these elements, HTML elements and attributes in the page whenever we want. We can change all the styling of all the element. We can add and remove existing elements which are there in the HTML. JavaScript can react to all existing HTML events in the page. So it has access to all the elements in the page. Okay, it can create its own new elements as well. So now to work with all these elements. Now elements here understand that they are nothing but all this. Import box, buttons, uh, option box okay or uh, say drop down or uh, some paragraph or anything that is there in the body now how will you get that element we have already seen one method called as get element by id method this method will help us to get a particular or specific element provided that element while defining in the HTML has one ID property and having some value to that ID property. Now, you can get any HTML element, okay, if you have defined its class property. Now, what is this class property all about? Now, when you say a button, okay, a button will look with its default properties, nothing with a gray color uh, and the background, but you want your button to look a bit better. So, what do you create? You create some styling. So, always your submit button should look uh, in green and your cancel button should be always in red color so if this is your styling so you can create two style classes one is for submit button and one is for cancel button and these classes you can include okay whenever you're writing so and so button so if you have added this class name then you can access that element based on that class name you can also access an element using its tag name what do you mean by tag name? A button has a tag button. Input box has a tag input. So you can get using like there is only one input you know and you want to get that input and you don't know its ID neither. You don't know what is the class value you have added. So what you can do is if you want to get that element input you can just say get elements by tag name and within this method you can write input. So this will help us to reach to that element. And once we reach to that element, we will be able to do whatever work that we want to do on that element. So let us see how do we reach to the element in the practicals. So here is the body that we have. So let us create a button here. Okay. Then let me create a paragraph here. A, B, C. Let me create something like, you know, input type is equal to say text. Okay, so I have around three elements here, a paragraph, a button and an input box. So I am happy I have three elements and let me try to use these three elements. Okay, no script I am adding. Let me use location dot back method to go back. Okay, this doesn't have any back method, so let me just see. Sorry, it is history, right? Dot 
back method okay again use the same one and I'm here on my first dot HTML and I get access to all these elements if I just go to this elements okay I understand that in the body there is button paragraph and there is input if I just move my cursor in this elements tab the specific element get highlighted I can change its styling here and check and the console what I want to write is write my JavaScript. So I would say something like document object dot get element by ID and I add some ID saying ABC. It will give me null because none of the elements is having any ID as the value. So let me say try it you know using something like class name now elements by class name. So add some class name, a random class name, say error. Okay, it will give me an array but a blank array whose length is zero. So that means there is no element who is having class as the attribute. Get element by tag name. This may help me. So I will say input. So I get in return the input that I have here if you just see if I click on that input here it gets highlighted so it is talking about the input that has got highlighted so if I don't have all these values I need to go for this value now in case if I had returned something like ID here ABC and save this page and render this page again then it would have helped me with this ID value so it would have given me back my paragraph so this is how I achieve my object and once I get that object now I can work over the object to change any of this I can change its styling I can change its text or I can work around with its events okay so let's move ahead this is how I get my objects or other elements okay it is document dot get element by ID here so I've got this value now I want to change its text so the property that I need to change here is nothing but inner HTML that will change its text so let me try to do or execute it here okay, I've already got the paragraph and I know that it is the right paragraph I have so I will change its property call as inner HTML and I just say that hi there I am inner HTML so can you see that the property has got changed that to dynamically okay so if you want to change anyone's property or rather the text that it has so you can go for that inner HTML property let's try to use it for others also let's see it's a button first of all you should know that by typing first you you should get the element if you're getting an element okay it is not giving you a element so basically you have to use by tag name and in the tag name you should write the tag okay so this thing has given you the element dot okay let me see inner HTML let's see if this is the property it has okay like cancel okay so it is not the property that it has so let's see value so let us see what all properties that button has so to see the properties okay I'm just showing you how to do it at runtime to see its properties go to elements click on that button on your right hand side will be all the styles that will be present okay and all the styles will tell you what is the output how it should look like so that's how we have changed paragraphs inner HTML that is we have changed its text let's try changing the style it has to change the style basically what we can do is set its value like this so using that element okay you can set its attribute and the attribute that you're going to set its style 
and within style what attribute do you want to change say color so you can change it to the whatever color that you want to change the style of an element if you have this paragraph here so first of all let's get the element that is step one get element by say ID ID here is ABC okay dot now you want to change something like its style to change its style you can just call the method that we have here in the example called less set attribute in the set attribute you can set the style of it that current style and you can change its color okay so let me try this okay, set attribute in which I, what I want to change is nothing but the style and within the style what I want to change is the color so I change this color here let me change it here first the color has changed but you cannot make out you can see that the color has already changed to blue okay it had changed to green but we couldn't see that color so all this color and styling whatever styling that you want to change you can definitely change to test you can just type in here for text okay so uh, maybe like text alignment would be somewhere like in the left if you want to move it or right so it has gone extremely right if you want to make it at the center okay it has overridden somewhere like left which is left so whatever styling that you want to change here first try it in the elements block because you get here a type forward okay and you will make sure that you will never make any spelling mistakes okay that is important so whatever styling that you want to change you can just change its width you can change its you know uh, height and you can do anything with that element here and in the JavaScript when you have to do make use of a method called a set attribute and within that you are setting which attribute that is nothing but the style of that and now within the style you can write these pairs that is name value pair name of the style and the value of the style so if you just click on this button the style that is given to this button is like color is this if you want to do some text alignment you can do it like at the center center so you wouldn't understand that so and so it has come to center you can just change the width of it and make it like not fit content but auto or you can also give some pixels to it say 200 let me see if it takes up these changes will not be shown here because the text that I have written is very small so using that value or that text only it just creates a button over it but styling you can definitely make use of this block okay using this block you can go to this console and using this set attribute style you can set its styles okay so that covers up the second part one was the text part another was the style part now let's move on to the third part that is nothing but the events part now what are events events are nothing but whatever things that happen like when a user clicks the mouse when the web page is loaded when an image has been loaded when the mouse moves over an element when the input field has changed when an HTML form is submitted, when a user presses or strokes a key, all these are nothing but events that happen behind the scene. And those events have some names which are given up, like click, double click, mouse move. Okay, so that means you just moved your mouse over it. Then mouse over, mouse down, mouse up. And there is something like you have touched an element using your mouse pointer. Okay you cancel the touch if you have pressed a key when the key raises up when the key goes down all these events are registered behind the scene 
if the form is focused when the form has become blurred it has got submitted it got changed so all these methods or other events are registered whichever method or registered event that you want to work with you can choose that particular event okay and write your code accordingly that on so and so event i want to perform so and so task so you are smartly using all the events for your work to be done so how do we add this event listener so whatever code we are going to write now that on particular event this code should execute that means what are we doing we are writing our own listeners what these listeners would do they will keep on listening to the event and when your particular event has occurred it will perform the task these are called as event listeners so let us understand how do we add these event listeners so you can add these event listeners either statically or dynamically how do we add them if you just see here attach event listener dynamically by using the event once you get an event in the script to get an event we know that there are many methods either by id or by class name or by tag name or there are many more methods once you get one element you call its add event listener method so in this add event listener method you can add as many listeners that you want maybe on click you want to add one listener on mouse over you want to add one listener okay on key down you want to add one listener so you can add as many events are there you can go ahead and add as many listeners to it so for example i want to add a listener only when that particular paragraph gets clicked so i add that listener first here and after adding the listener i want to perform some task so that task i have added in a function okay in that function what do i do i change its styling so that's what i have been doing so i call that function so only when this particular event gets occurred this function will be executed let's try to add one event listener here to the code that we have so we have here a paragraph let's add here an event listener so create a new javascript file save it as event so just say event.js so that the name is smaller we won't make any mistakes okay the event listener javascript file has an event that para clicked what is this para click doing it will get the paragraph document dot get element by id and its id is abc once it gets this element it will set attribute that is nothing but the style attribute in the style i am going to change its color to say blue because blue is visible now when should i call this paragraph i should call this paragraph or this function only and only when my paragraph is clicked now for that what do i do in the javascript okay i write document dot get element by id that is my abc id okay i add an event listener okay which will be working only when i click it and that time i just call this function para clicked so i've written a task that whenever i get this abc on the click event of it call this method so i go to my html page and i try to add my script here the name of the script is event dot javascript save this file okay okay and refresh this file by default it has got a color blue to change it to yellow so by default what happens is that it just adds a listener so when you write this particular file okay see the uh, syntax that is followed i have written a function that upon the paragraph is clicked okay execute this function now add a listener while you are adding the listener make sure that you just write the name of the method and do not call it do not follow it with the round bracket just mention which method to be called now 
refresh the page okay upon clicking this particular paragraph your javascript will get executed and the value of this abc will change that is called as adding a listener dynamically let us create one more listener now say something like mouse over and here let us put one more function para mouse over and this will be called when it is mouse over and at that time let's make it blue so save this file you have added two listeners one is for click one is for mouse over let me see if this works for us so initially it is black i move it move my mouse pointer it becomes blue if i click on it it becomes yellow so this is how i have added many listeners or other two listeners for my paragraph okay all the listeners or the events are always in small case make sure about it there are two words also mouse over or mouse out a key down on load whatever events are there they are always in small case make sure that you write it in small case and when you add a li event listener dynamically make sure you write the function name without a calling round bracket okay let's try to see how we can add the value statically how do we add statically it is when we write our html the element html on that only we can write the event like now i have this button event so i have this button i have written this statically in my html on the click of this button if i want to call any function so i'll be writing here the name of the function before that i will be creating a function here button say click okay on the click of this button what will i do is i will just set its attribute some of its attribute let us put one id for our button so that we'll get this let the id be b set its attribute okay let's just set its color to be blue okay so on click i want this particular method to be called so what i do here is i write the method name okay and its parenthesis this is how i add statically so while writing the element itself i make sure that on click event so and so method should be called let me see if this works for me Okay, so I have refreshed. On the click of it, its text becomes blue. Okay, I can add one more event if I want, but all the events I will have to write here. Okay, maybe like on you know mouse over. Okay, I can call one more method like button mouse over. On mouse over, I will call one more function here, named as function on mouse over and using the same i can just say that the color should be yellow let me try and check it if this works okay whether i've saved my html file here i need to save html as well if when i mouse over the value changes to yellow when i click it becomes blue So this is how I can add statically and dynamically all these methods, or rather, the event registration can happen. So this is how we add our events. Now, one of the famous event that we add is like form validation. So if I add anything, you know, like uh, I've created a form. So the form has first name, last name, age, phone number. So in that, in the name part, I don't want somebody to write. numbers so that's my validation part i cannot tell my server to validate that i have javascript on my ui side so i can make use of that javascript and using that javascript i can do all the validations like this so i can have a method called as validate form in that form i can get whichever value that is there use that value and even write if it is kept blank then i can say that okay it is a must that you fill the name okay something like that so validation 
something like you know if it is not type of a number then also it can be taken care of so all these things can be taken care of when we are validating a form so let's see one beautiful example of how do we actually validate the form so the first step would be creating okay your form so a form may have something like you know button okay a paragraph and everything that is added using that value we can just test whether it is a number it is not filled or whatever is the output and we can tell the user that please do fill its values and then make sure that you add only numbers in it make sure you add only data in it or like text in it whatever validations that you want to do you can do it so let us create a small form create a form okay what you have to make use of is a form tag within a form tag you may write something like name type is text okay then you can write it say id name and you may end the input tag okay so this is your name okay and when you are adding a phone number make sure that you add one more input okay type so let's also make it as text first okay its id is phone number okay after adding both these things you will submit your data okay so now after adding this submit button what we can do is we can call a function so somebody clicks this particular method we can add something like you know validates maybe a method will be called using this method you can write a code function name of the method is validate form in this method what do i do i want to check okay whether name is added or not so what do i do i get that name element first dot get element by id and what is the id here name so let me take that in a variable say where name similarly i'll create one more variable phone number and i will get that element okay in this variable so in this validate form form i have both the elements now to check whether the name has been added or not if it is blank then i want to tell that okay please don't add something like blank okay before submitted add some value to it so what i do is i check whether name dot value okay is null so what i do i write here an if case okay is equal to is equal to null okay if that is the case then i put an alert saying that please enter some value in name okay so let us see if this works for me okay how do i check whether anything is null or not null is simple by using this either i can just use if it is blank okay or it is null okay or anything so let's try out first null okay if that doesn't work then let's just check with the blank string so i get this form and without a submitting okay i send this submit so well it is not null it has some value okay let's try to check whether it works with this so it tells me please enter some value in the name so only when i add some value in the name it will get submitted it will not give me an error it will give me an error if i do not add anything in the name so i come here i feel okay i have done one type of validation let me just comment all these things add a break statement okay and place it nicely here so i have this name and phone number which i can use i feel phone number is okay they may leave it as a blank one now i try to check okay the second test that i want to check is if name is dot value if it is a number that is added or not so there is a method called is not a number if this value is not a number this will give me true 
if it is a number then this will give me false okay so it is very important that i use this is not a number carefully so now name dot value should not be a number so is not a number okay should be true here so if it is false then i should send one alert So I refresh this page and I add nothing. So it tells me add some value. Okay, it also tells me that you have to add some text. So it tells me that yes, you've added a number and I want you to add some text to it. So when I add something text, then only it doesn't give me an error. Similarly, I can check it with phone number. So let me take the phone number object and this time I don't want to negate it if it is not a number then I want to add please enter number in phone number so add here proper values and here I add instead of a number add some text so it tells me that please add a number value in phone number so this is how I can validate my form okay in my own way so I can write all these cases okay and I can beautifully write these cases in if else or in you know if else if else then um, then I can make use of you know something like you know even switch statements I can take a switch value okay and if it is a number then you write something if it is something so I can do make use of all the loops all the operators that I have who can create a beautiful validation form method Okay, let's see what presentation has to give us. So here we have created H2, then uh, one paragraph that's saying that please add a number between 1 to 0. And I create one input, okay. I put its ID as num and I have a button, okay, on click of which, okay, my function will get called. My function, okay, has something like it has taken a variable value here. So directly the value of that element is taken and that value is checked whether it is not a number then you put so and so if it, you have added a number then you would say input is ok and that's what you write in the paragraph below that number instead of giving an alert box also you can add one more paragraph here after every element you can add one paragraph ok and that paragraphs inner HTML you can change so this is JavaScript all about when it comes to event handling and objects. Your feedback is very, very important to us. Do write to us. Do give your suggestion to improve much more than what we are. Thank you for the great session, Corey. I hope all of you found it informative. So if you have any further queries related to JavaScript, please comment in the comment section below. Until then, that's all from our side today. Thank you and happy learning. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!